What would you do if you could be invisible? Could you walk around naked all the time? I did that for a while. It's all right. A little chilly, though. Would you stalk your celebrity crush? Maybe get your own private celebrity sex tape? I mean, don't lie. Totally would. I did. Would you steal? Would you kill? Would you travel the world, see everything? How much depraved shit can you think of? Or would you use your power for good instead of evil? Liar. I was born with the gift of invisibility. Or I guess you could call it a curse, depending on how you look at it. See, at first, I didn't realize my power. It bothered me for a long time. I'd be standing there with a group of friends talking about sports or music or whatever, and then suddenly, they wouldn't see me anymore. No matter what I did or said, they would just ignore me. Even my words didn't register as if I were speaking into a void. My parents did it too. I'd be in the car with them around the dinner table having a conversation when suddenly it was like I didn't exist. My parents would talk back and forth about their day when, and when I told them about something exciting that happened to me at school, they'd just ignore me. In class, I would put up my hand and the teacher's eyes would skip over me only to ask someone else for the answer. Girls ignored me. Guys ignored me. Couldn't make friends no matter how hard I tried. My family moved to another city the year I started high school, and the problem became even worse. The friends I had made as a little kid were no longer around, and I was alone all the time. That was around when I realized what was happening. I was turning invisible. That wasn't happening all the time, but it was occurring more and more frequently as I got older. And as I became more shy and introverted, I was scared to get to know anyone, scared to talk to anyone. All I could think about was the fact that if I did make a new friend, they were going to start ignoring me at some point. And I would be alone again. So I just wandered the halls during lunch hour at school, feeling alone and invisible. I got through high school and college blending in with the walls and getting more lonely by the day. I was terrified of forced socialization via any group projects that were presented to us. The idea of interacting with other human beings on a face-to-face -face level was becoming more and more scary to me. Part of me felt like I might become invisible and I might never be seen again. Forced to wander the earth as a ghost for the rest of my days. Every time I disappeared, I was sure I would stay that way and it was never voluntary. But every time I disappeared, I became visible again later on. The worst part was I couldn't tell when it was happening. I could always see myself no matter what. After college, I landed a job which didn't require me to interact with anyone, except occasionally with coworkers and my boss. Most of my conversations happened through email, and even those were ignored half the time. Even as an adult, nobody talked to me in the office or invited me for drinks with a gang after work. Meetings proceeded without me, and people walked past my desk every morning without saying hello, as if I didn't exist. A while back, the thing I'd been fearing most finally happened. My boss called my cell phone in the middle of a workday. I missed the call since I had it on vibrate. I looked down to see the notification on my phone. I was about to go into his office to talk to him when he came out and began to yell loudly, Where's Jordan? Has anybody seen him? Every time I need his help with something, he's nowhere to be found. He sounded angry. I stood up and I raised my hand. I'm right here, Mr. Jacobson. What do you need my help with? Nobody heard me. Another co-worker, a man named Brett, who had always had it out for me, stood up and began to complain about my absence as well. I'm not sure where he is, sir. Every time I look over at his desk, he's conspicuously absent. I was going to say something to you, but I don't like to complain about my co-workers. It's getting ridiculous, though. Mr. Jacobson shook his head muttering under his breath and marched back towards his office. One more phone call. If he doesn't pick up this time, I'm firing his ass. I hurried after him, leaving my phone on my desk. Sir, wait, please, I'm right here. He slammed the door in my face. I tried the doorknob, but it was locked. I knocked and yelled, but he didn't answer. When I got back to my desk, there was another voicemail waiting for me. This one saying I was fired for my unexplained absences from work. 
There seemed no point in trying to stop it from happening. I just packed up my things silently and left. Nobody noticed. The periods of invisibility grew longer and longer until finally, I came to realize that I could only be seen one day a year. For the rest of the year, all 364 days, I was a ghost. It was always the same day, and it was easy enough to remember. It was my birthday. It made sense. People noticed me on that day and remembered me, even if it was just for 24 hours. I'd get a call from my parents and a few Facebook messages, but that was about it. Still, it felt nice to exist again. I didn't have a job anymore, so I had to start getting creative with ways to make money. I still needed to pay my bills and buy groceries. It helped that nobody could see me. That made the next part easier. Those first few times hopping the counter of the bank were nerve-wracking. My heart was racing, and I was just waiting for someone to start yelling at me, threatening to call the cops. But after I'd done it about ten times, it felt more or less like going to the grocery store. I'd just hop over the counter and grab a stack of bills from the teller drawer when they weren't paying attention. The second I touched the bills, it was like they didn't exist anymore, and the bank tellers didn't even notice them leaving the drawers. Part of me didn't mind stealing from banks, since they took money from customers all the time, without apology. But I didn't want to steal from a mom-and-pop store or a grocery store. I wanted to be normal as much as possible. Besides, I was having fun with bank robberies in broad daylight. There was a thrill in making money from the bank, right in front of the teller's eyes. That feeling was a rush. Pretty soon, I was chasing that feeling all the time. Finding expensive merchandise to steal was easy. And stealing it was even easier. But you realize pretty quickly that possessions are hollow and meaningless. You can have anything that you want at a whim. I took cars from big dealerships, Porsches, Ferraris, BMWs, Lamborghinis, Mercedes, you name it. But driving wasn't a great idea in my condition. I got into a lot of car accidents. People never saw me coming. It's no fun driving a sports car if you can't drive it fast. Believe me. Somewhere along the line, I must have drawn attention to myself, because one night, as I was walking home, I saw someone standing on the sidewalk in front of my house, waiting for me. The man was wearing a black trench coat and a fedora. He had sunglasses on, despite the darkness. I slowed my approach when I saw him, but felt drawn towards him like a magnet. So, you're the one I've been hearing so much about, he said, seeing me despite my invisibility. The one who's been causing so much trouble drawing so much attention to us. You can see me? I said, surprised. How can you see me? Because I'm just like you, he answered. I'm a shadow. So are they. From all around me came shapes from the darkness. Some of them were people, but others... Others were really just like shadows, barely tangible in the night. They grabbed hold of my arms and legs, tightening their grips on me as I screamed. It felt like I was being mugged by a pack of boa constrictors. Shh, 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 the man said, putting a finger on my lips, silencing my screams. Nobody can hear you except for us. Who are you? I said nervously, my heart pounding, looking around at their faces. Some were featureless and without form. But the same as you. We're here to teach you how to be a better shadow, how to remain unseen. You've been too blatant in your movements. People are starting to notice you. The tellers of the bank are finding cash missing at the end of the day, and the grocery store owner is wondering why nobody notices the mysterious customer who leaves a pile of cash after shopping. Like a ghost is visiting the store. What do you want me to do? I asked. I can't work. I, I need to get food somewhere. No, you don't. You're a shadow, remember? Shadows don't eat. They don't drive BMWs, and they don't visit the bank. You're not being a very good shadow. That's why we're here to teach you. They began to press in tighter around me, and I felt myself being compressed like a lump of coal, being turned into a diamond. I was shrinking into the ground, becoming flattened, and at the same time losing some essential essence of myself. I felt like my personality was being compressed like... My soul was being photocopied into a lower resolution version of itself, becoming a sliver. And then, even less than that. Never in my life had I felt so afraid, so unsure. And finally, all I could see were the figures looming over me, 
towering high above me from my insectile vantage point. I was nothing more than a shadow on the sidewalk to them, and to everyone else as well. There. That's better. Now you're a proper shadow. The group of them disappeared, and I found myself alone. Terrified. Being a shadow has not been anywhere near as nice as being invisible. I got into all sorts of trouble when I was invisible, let me tell you. I had a lot of fun. I got into a lot of depraved mischief. In retrospect, I'm not that surprised that I got caught. I'm more shocked at how it happened. And the consequences of my actions were very unexpected. It's a pretty terrible punishment being made into a shadow. Especially since shadows never die. They don't have a lifespan or anything like a normal person. Or even... Even like an invisible person. Still, once a year on my birthday, I become tangible again. I get to see my family. I get to breathe the fresh air and eat food and drink wine. And I get to be a person again. Today. And only today. I find myself taking more advantage of life than I used to. I go to see my parents on my birthday these days. I visit my old friends. I go to the park. I say hello to perfect strangers as I walk around in sunshine. Only real people can enjoy the sunshine. Shadows never get to feel it. Tomorrow I'll be a shadow again. And it's a very cold life. But for now I'll enjoy the warmth of the sun. Even if it's only for a little while. When my husband saw the man in the purple suit, he spat his pastrami sandwich all over my fake Chanel purse. That guy's supposed to be dead, he coughed. My son, who was too young to understand that my husband choked to death, would be the best thing that could happen to our family, patted his father's back with a fat little hand. Here's the thing about gangsters. They've got loose lips. All that tough guy and murder stuff died out with the ones who came over from Italy. I mean, it's practically how I met my husband, Ralph. He swaggered over to the creep beside me at the bar and whispered into his ear, Fuck off, I'm connected. At the time, I thought it was hot. But now that my husband and his ego have both doubled in size, it's just a question of what will get him first. A heart attack or a Rico indictment? What guy? I asked. As if it could be anyone other than the purple-suited Haitian man with face tattoos and golden jewelry staring at us from across the food court. His teeth glittered when he smiled at us. He's coming over here. Ralph cracked his knuckles and neck like he always did when he was nervous. Before I could slip away to the bathroom, the purple-suited man had boxed us into the table. Andre, my husband hissed. I thought I killed you. Did you? Andre's voice sure sounded dead. Pure monotone, come to think of it. His face looked pretty cadaverous as well. Although that might have been the case before my husband stabbed him five times in the chest with an ice pick. Ice is also what I thought of when Andre grabbed my wrist with a frigid hand and brought it to his jugular. There's no pulse. Nothing. Why don't you ask your wife what she thinks? I think he's dead, babe, I whispered hoping that would make Andre let me go. His gold ring was even colder than his skin, and it cut into my fingers. The man I thought I married would have pistol-whipped Andre right there in the middle of the food court for touching his wife, cops or no cops. But Ralph just kept sweating and eyeballing mall security. Hey, man, Ralph shrugged. Leave the family out of this. This is between you and me. Men's business. No need to make it... personal. My husband, who has less emotional intelligence than a rectal thermometer, seemed to not realize that he'd already made it pretty personal when he killed the guy. Daddy? Ralphie Jr. looked ready to wet his pants when Andre's pale eyes drifted over him. Like father, like son. At least the security people were on the way over. Married to a mafioso, and I was about to be saved by a mall cop. Story of my life. At least he was kind of cute. Andre leaned forward so that his unbuttoned shirt fell open. 
treating us all to a front row view of the five putrid black holes in his chest. I don't need to sleep, Ralph. I don't need to eat, or drink, or even shit. Do you believe that? All I have to do, Andre grinned, is make your life a living hell. Until I decide to take it away. With that, Andre let me go. He put his hands above his head from all security as he passed, don't shoot style, and laughed a hollow laugh. The laugh of the dead. Then he was gone. This can't be happening, Ralph started repeating as soon as we got to the SUV. Andre was a nobody, a pimp, an addict, a small-time dealer who tried to cut in on the wrong hustle. They poured a concrete slab on top of where we buried him, for Christ's sake. Very next day, the cops had the car bugged. I could forget about our upcoming trip to Cancun. On the drive home, Ralph's face went from irritated purple to terrified pale as he called the guys. One by one, they each failed to pick up. Probably already gotten their little visit from Andre, the walking corpse, and decided to skip town. So much for blood, brotherhood. Why save you for last? I asked. Because it was my idea, Ralph admitted. He was selling on my turf. We didn't set an example. I turned the radio up until I couldn't hear my husband's excuses and kept it that way until we parked in the driveway. I wasn't trying to become an accessory to murder. If Andre's goal was to suck all the joy out of our lives, it worked. Look, we spent every waking moment waiting for him to show up. Ralph, too. Although he'd never admit it. He sat in front of the TV with a pistol in one hand and a cold brew in the other and jumped at every little sound. I was the one who had to clean the plates from his stress eating. And that was how I came face to face with Andre for the second time. I don't know how long his face was pressed against the glass staring at me, but when I looked up, those sunken eyes were inches away from mine. I screamed. I, I think I actually threw the dish rag at the window, but Andre didn't budge. Of course, by the time I got Ralph up and moving, he would disappeared once again. Ralph didn't believe that I'd actually seen him. A woman's overactive imagination, he called it. He said the same thing about the creaking noises we heard on the roof that night. I called them footsteps. He called them the house settling. He found the smoke and flames coming from the burning ceiling a few hours later a little harder to explain away, however. So how about it, babe? I snarled at him as I pulled out my pink fluffy bathrobe and dragged Ralphie Jr. out of our burning home. Did my overactive imagination set the house on fire too? The fireman who called our hotel room later said that someone had poured gasoline all over our roof. I didn't have to ask who the second call was from. The one that came around 3 a.m. the same night. I'm going to take everything from you. Andre's rasping voice boomed from the phone speaker until it filled the room. Piece by piece. Same as you did to me. Ralph had to go meet with the insurance people alone. There'd been some nasty insinuations about fraud, and yet our lawyer was suddenly nowhere to be found. In the meantime, I took Ralphie Jr. to the dingy 90s-style arcade and the hotel pool. It's funny. All his expensive toys were burned to a crisp. But there he was, having the time of his life. I actually started to think this might all work out in the end. After all I'd been through, I was still kicking, with diamonds in my earrings and a hotel bar mojito in my hand, no less. Ralph was back from the meeting, too, laying in the deck chair beside me like a sunburned, snoring whale. And Ralphie Jr. Where was Ralphie Jr.? The last I'd seen of him, he was doing a cannonball into the deep end. The mojito hit me hard when I stood up, and harder still when I saw the unbreathing man holding my son against the bottom of the pool. Andre looked up at me and grinned. Then he let Ralphie Jr. go. For once, I was grateful for my son's extra ballast. He came up right away, sputtering and screaming. Andre strolled out from the depths of the pool. He walked over to Ralph, and in a move that was surprisingly deft for a corpse, 
He pulled my husband's swim trunks down and knotted them around his ankles. Ah! Ralph snored awake. Ah! He saw Andre try to stand and face plant it. Andre walked out of the hotel with my husband in hot pursuit. The desk clerk didn't even look up from his phone. Even. The kind of place where a dripping guy in a purple suit, being chased through the lobby by an obscene naked Italian man, wasn't such an unusual occurrence. I stayed with Ralphie Jr. trying to get the water out of his lungs, which probably hadn't gotten a workout like this since the last time he'd chased the ice cream truck. I got to my feet quick, though, when I heard a familiar engine rumble to life. The dead guy was stealing my SUV. Since the car and my husband were both lost causes, I went up to the room where my worst fears were confirmed. While we'd been getting a tan, Andre had cleaned us out. Like most in his line of work, my husband kept his money in hard cash and jewelry. But the keys to our safe and deposit boxes were gone too. I suddenly wondered how much was left on our only remaining credit card after all the mojitos. There was a putrid smell coming from the bathroom. All of our clothes were in the tub, soaking in a brown, blue gunk that I recognized as the guts of a porta potty. Andre must have hauled it up by the bucket full. I had to hand it to the guy. He didn't skimp when it came to revenge. That was what finally broke Ralph. Realizing it was all gone, the house, the money, his friends, even his clothes. He wasn't connected anymore. He was a helpless nobody. Just like Andre had been. Maybe that was the point. I don't think any of us were surprised when the knock on the hotel room door came at midnight. Oh, and Ralph shuffled over to answer it without even trying to defend himself. I don't know what happened to Ralph after he left with Andre that night. I don't want to know. All I know is that I never saw my husband again. But hey, I can't complain. At least Andre didn't fuck around with the life insurance policy. So if you can see ghosts, I asked the woman, shellacking my nails, why are you doing this for a living? You try, lady. Put out an ad, see what you get. Susan, my manicure, snorted. I tried, and I got three calls. A family of seven who tried to baptize me. A schizo who tried to stab me with a needle. And the guy in the hotel room. Well, what he had under his bathrobe might have been pretty much invisible, but it didn't make it a ghost. See you in three weeks, I asked when she finished. <laughs> Don't think so. Susan wrinkled her nose. No offense, but you've got the stink of death about you. She hesitated. Either that, or Tiffany microwaved fish for lunch again. I thought things would get better after a dead guy made my mobster husband disappear, and I moved to the Midwest with my son, Ralphie Jr. I can't specify the place, but it's a town with a dying mall where unhappily married couples go to sip half-priced cocktails at Applebee's. And the hottest action on a Saturday night is cruising the Walmart parking lot with the radio blaring and the windows down. If you think that narrows it down, well, good luck. Right, Ralphie Jr. He's had some um, trouble adjusting to school. And it's no wonder you drop one F-bomb around here and people act like you just took a shit in their Wonder Bread and mayonnaise sandwich or something. I mean, the closest thing to an international community is one guy from Paris. Paris, Kentucky. What was I saying? Right, Ralphie Jr. The school. Now, Ralphie Jr. getting picked on is nothing new, you know? Kids can be so cruel, so petty, so prejudiced. And believe me, my little Ralphie deserves every bit of it. Last time I got called for a parent conference was because a kid was picking on Ralphie. It turned out that the kid hit Ralphie Jr. because my sweet little boy took his sandwich at lunch. Every day. For a year. I would have hit him too. What worries me is that Ralphie has made a friend, Ryan. Ralphie Jr. won't shut up about him. Ryan's amazing at hide-and-seek. It's like he disappears. You should have seen how high Ryan jumped today at recess. Nobody picks on me when I hang out with Ryan. The way Ralphie Jr. was talking, I was imagining this Ryan kid to be, I don't know, some kind of miniature Hulk picking Ralphie Jr. up from school a few days ago. I got a glimpse of him. Ryan looked as thin and weak as a gas station coffee. One of those smudge-faced 
puffy-eyed, pale kids who sits in the back and never says anything. He was carrying a scuffed-up teddy bear beneath one arm. Okay, so that was weird. But not as weird as our conversation in the car. The substitute fell and broke her ankle today, Ralphie Jr. explained, cheerfully, as though nothing could have pleased him more. She shouldn't have told Ryan to put away his teddy bear. I guess she didn't know. Didn't know what, I wondered. Did I get my mouth shut? Because I knew that Ralphie Jr., just like his dearly departed father, would spill all those secrets that he was trying so hard to keep if I just stayed quiet and let him do it. I was thinking, Ralphie Jr. began, in the same trying not to be nonchalant tone my dead husband used to put on just before asking me if he could use my credit card to put a down payment on a boat or some other sketchy thing. Do you think I could go over to Ryan's house sometime? Like, today, maybe? The apple didn't fall far from the shit for Brain's tree, it seemed. I groaned and I asked him for the address. Truth was, I wanted to meet this Ryan kid's parents, partially to see if they were psychos and partially to see if that bland little boy happened to have a hot, rich, single dad. If our kids already got along, that was a start, right? Well, I was still daydreaming about this Midwestern surfer millionaire dad when we pulled into Ryan's driveway. Early 2000s brick ranch house, no lights in the windows. The yard was a little small, but I cared more about the master bedroom closet space anyway. Walking up the driveway holding Ralphie Jr.'s hand, I wondered if Ryan's dad and I would like the same wines. We rang the bell. Twice. No answer. I guess your friend isn't home, I sighed. And his dad isn't either. But as I loosened my grip on Ralphie Jr.'s hand and turned to check on the car... Something happened that chilled my blood. The door of the house flew open and Ralphie Jr.'s fingers slipped through mine. By the time I spun back around, it was like the house had swallowed him up. Hey! I pounded on the locked door. Hey! Rafael Palumbo Jr., you open this door right now, mister! Ryan, are you in there? Anybody? Hey! Mother's instinct, I guess, but the thought of what might be happening to my son inside that dark, silent house was driving me crazy. I bruised my shoulder, slamming all of my 125 pounds against the door again and again. Maybe only a few minutes had passed, but it felt like hours. I looked around for something to smash a window with. Mommy? Ralphie Jr. asked when I turned around again. Why are you holding a tree stump? It was a long ride home. Apparently, Ralphie Jr. informed me, Ryan couldn't play after all, but at least he'd given Ralphie Jr. what he came for. And that's when I noticed it. A teddy bear. A gray, one-eyed thing with a perpetual frown stitched onto its muzzle like a sick love child of Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh. I wondered if it had bed bugs. Oh, that's... nice. I was at a loss for words. So nice, I'm sure Ryan misses it a lot. We better take it right back, hon. We can't, Ralphie explained, in a flat, terrified tone that I'd never heard him use before, not even when he was looking at an actual dead guy. Ryan says I have to take Chip for a little while, and I don't want to make Ryan mad. Chip. <laughs> at first the name made me roll my eyes, but then it made me wonder. There was a bit of bead missing from the top of Chip's single eye giving the gray bear a perpetual, hateful, downturned look. My son was staring into that broken eye like it was a peephole to the darkness beyond the stars or something like that. He took the bear to his room the moment he got home. Probably should have followed him, but dinner wasn't made and the dirty clothes were stacked high enough to be an OSHA violation. What can I say? When you've got nothing to wear to work tomorrow, the laundry takes priority over diabolical stuffed animals. Ralphie Jr.'s room was dark, the door half open when I finally checked on him upstairs. Honey, I shouted. I cut the crusts off your pepperoni sandwiches. Something dribbled on my cheek. I looked up. Ralphie Jr. was dragging himself along the ceiling with his head turned around almost backwards. The teddy bear was clenched in his drooling jaws. I was too terrified to move, but when I opened my mouth, it was my mother voice that came out instead of a scream. Raphael Palumbo Jr., you come down from there this instant. My son did as he was told, but not in the way I imagined. I knew Ralphie Jr. was overweight. I didn't fully understand how bad it had gotten until he dropped onto my head. 
While Ralphie Jr. gurgled in the language of hell and tried to pull out my eyeballs, I tugged at the teddy bear between his teeth. It was clearly the cause of all this. What had made Ryan jump high and hide so well, when it finally came free, Ralphie Jr. collapsed in an exhausted heap. You're going in the blender, you little shit. I screamed at the bear in a cocktail of rage and fear. It didn't like that at all. Something rippled like flexing muscles beneath the cloth, and the stuffed arm I was holding onto got hot. Hot enough to burn. I yelped and dropped the flaming teddy bear, which crawled around, setting fire to my landlady's carpet. I wondered if this would be covered under my right to bear firearms. I grabbed one of my dead husband's golf clubs and gave chase, but that tiny bastard was fast for his size. A hateful blue glow full of evil intelligence radiated from Chip's single eye, and with a wave of its paw, a dresser flew across the room and nearly smashed my head like a melon. Next thing I knew, I was swinging the golf club like a maniac. Playing baseball with my Ikea furniture, I rolled Ralphie Jr. out of the way, ducked beneath a flying desk lamp, and gave that little fucker a hole-in-one straight to the jaw. Four! I yelled as the possessed bear flew backwards into the hall closet. I jammed what was left of my coffee table under the closet door, which had started to vibrate with telekinetic force. A blue glow came from inside. Ralphie Jr. was unconscious, but at least he was breathing. I had no idea what to do, so I looked at my phone. And I thought of Andre. My dead mobster husband, Ralph, had kept all his drug dealer contacts and code in the little black book, which I held on to for some reason. Andre had been a part of that world. Was it possible that his number might still be inside? I wasn't worried about the code. Ralph had thought that it was clever, but I cracked it halfway through an episode of Desperate Housewives years ago. That was how I'd been able to send sympathy cards to all his mistresses. It took some finding, and the pounding and smoke from upstairs was really annoying. But before long, I was dialing, and someone picked up. I kept waiting to hear breathing on the other end of the line, but then I remembered that Andre didn't breathe. Andre, I asked, trying to sound sweet, do you remember me? There was no reply, but the sound of my heartbeat, and then... Yeah. I wondered what I should say. Something like, wow, you sound great. It's like you've... Barely rotted at all. I decided the truth was the best way to go. I've got a possessed stuffed animal. Do you know anybody who might be interested in something like that? A very long pause. Where is the trapped one? The violent, raspy shift in Andre's voice almost made me drop the phone. Uh, in my house. Get out! And send me the address. We just moved here? I whined. The buyer will compensate you. Andre named a figure. And I decided I didn't like living in a giant cornfield that much after all. What else can I say? Looks like Ralphie Jr. and I are on the road again. If Las Vegas is America's playground... And then the rest of Nevada is America's kitty litter box. And out here, the weirdest turds don't stay buried for long. Elvis was already dead when I ran him over. I'm absolutely convinced of that, whatever Ralphie Jr. says. Even with my shades on, the blazing sun reflecting off the desert made my eyes hurt. And I thought the white-tasseled lump on the road was just another mirage until my tires bumped over a beer gut and Elvis burst like a ripe strawberry on the desert highway. Of course, we stopped right away. I snatched Ralphie Jr.'s phone out of his hand before he could upload the gruesome scene to TikTok, and then I moved to inspect the damage. Pretty sure I could smell my shoes melting into the pavement. At first, I was relieved when I saw the middle-aged Elvis impersonator had been a corpse for a while, but then... Then I started to think about how he must have died. A gory rope of intestines led off into the desert behind the guy. Who knew how long he'd been crawling around trying to hold his guts in? It had the coyotes got to him. Hmm. Coyotes. Ralphie, honey, I began. Get back in the car. By the time I turned around, it was too late. There were four of them between us and the SUV, grayish-brown, dog-like, with bushy tails. Their sunken yellow eyes were hungry. I could see their ribs through their patchy fur. So why were two of them chewing on the tires instead of us? I didn't want to think about the possibilities that they were disabling the SUV on purpose. The other two coyotes approached, stopping about ten feet away, and just... stared at us. 
waiting. Parched, cracked dirt in every direction, sulfur-colored cliffs on the horizon, the shoe-melting strip of road. There was absolutely nowhere to run or hide. When the tires finally deflated, all four coyotes began to circle us. I wondered how much it would hurt to climb a cactus. A blood-curdling howl stopped them in their tracks. They snapped their heads toward the source of the sound, which stood beside a dick-shaped rock on the hazy distance. It looked like another coyote, but that was impossible because coyotes don't walk on two legs. Whatever it was, it yipped and it snarled. A warning at the four starving beasts in front of me, in a language they apparently understood. Looking down the road, I understood why. A gigantic semi-truck was speeding towards us. Ralphie Jr. and I both ran towards it, waving our arms like shipwreck survivors. The driver accelerated, then slowed, then accelerated again, almost like he was too afraid to stop. Either that or nobody had taught him how to shift. And the 18-wheeler skidded to a halt beside us in a cloud of dust. A weather-beaten guy with a Sam Elliott mustache stuck a shotgun out the window. Democrat or Republican? He demanded. What the fuck does that have to do with anything? I snapped. I just want to ride. Sam Elliott mustache man thought this over for a minute. Okay, I guess you guys are human after all. Come on up. Do you always ask helpless stranded women about their politics? I asked. Crossly, and Ralphie Jr. and I settled into the truck's cab. Or am I a special case? Nah, the driver sighed. Had to make sure you could talk. That was the first thing that popped into my head. There's a bad stretch of road. There's some uh, unnatural things out there, but they can't talk. I was just making sure you wouldn't want them. The other guys would probably say I'm a damn fool for stopping at all. I'm Ted, by the way. Ted Yellowhorse. The interior of the cab smelled like nicotine, royal pine car freshener, and melted gummy worms, but it was better than being out there. Yep, there's a bad stretch of road, all right. Even before some folks started disappearing a couple months ago. My people call this place Salted Earth. There's nothing can survive out there. Plus, maybe it was already dead to begin with. As Ted rambled on, we passed a dusty abandoned Cadillac with shredded tires. Then the door hanging open. I figured that was Elvis's ride. Poor guy. Wondered what had made his tires go flat. Oh shit! Ted slammed on the brakes and clutched the wheel as we rolled over something spiky and hard. The truck jackknifed, rolled over, and I felt my son's pudge slam into the side of my head for the second time in a week. After the dust settled and after I'd wiped Ted's cigarette ashes out of my hair and shoved his fallen porno mags off my lap, I realized the predicament that we were in. The truck was laying on its side, and I doubted it was going to cheerfully right itself anytime soon. Ted groaned, blood trickling down his scalp. Outside, a hundred coyotes howled in victory. Ted didn't wake, not even when Ralphie stepped on his face in his flurry to escape. The ice in the spilled 44-ounce drink on my door, now the floor, brought back memories of high school friends comforting me while I puked into the toilet. They rubbed something cold in the back of my neck to snap me out of it. Listen, asshole, I whispered to Ted as I splashed ice onto his neck. You're not just going to bail on us like a minor character in a shitty horror story. Not today. My son and I have been through enough already, and the last time I shot a shotgun, the recoil gave me a black eye. Get it together. Ted groaned and opened his eyes. I freed him from his seatbelt, and we climbed out into the late afternoon sun. Broken down vehicles were all around us. It was almost like being back in New Jersey. One sedan had a coyote-sized hole in its windshield. The inside spattered with what was left of the passengers. The pickup truck had lost control and slammed into a rock. The half-eaten driver hung out of the window. Great. This is a bad stretch of road, Ted repeated helplessly. In one hand, he held the bloody cloth to his head, and on the other, the shotgun. He gave the cliffs a thousand stare. There's a cave up there. We need to make it there before sunset. What? I huffed. That's like five miles. No. Eight. Or you can wait for the coyotes. Slogging across the parched dirt, a waterfall of sweat pouring down my back and flies that felt as big as buzzards biting my neck, I made a silent promise that if I survived this, I'd remove Love's Hiking from my Tinder bio. Mother Nature is the biggest bitch of them all, I thought, as I rolled my ankle and cringed. How do you know there's a cave up there, Mr. Ted? 
Ralphie Jr. panted. Some of your ancestors massacred some of my ancestors up there. You know what a massacre is, kid? It's like... Ralphie Jr. murmured. Like what the coyotes did. That's right, Ted glared. Just like the coyotes. The sun was fat and orange as a pumpkin by the time we reached the bottom of the cliffs. There, at least, was something like a trail, even if it was partially vertical. Ralphie Jr. was treating the whole thing like a Boy Scout trip. Ted was surprisingly agile for a man who sat in a truck 14 hours per day, and as for me, I just tried not to look down. The mouth of the cave was in sight before Ted was willing to stop. It was at the top of a hollowed-out dent in the cliff. A big ice cream spoon had scooped out the yellowed rock around us. You two wait here. Ted grunted. He was gone for a long time. I, I shivered as I looked out over the dead land. The strand of wrecked cars and the dark shapes darting amongst the rocks and cacti below. One in particular made me grab Ralphie Jr.'s hand and lay as flat as I could against the still warm stone. It was three times the size of the other coyotes and was walking straight towards us, as casual as a businessman on his way to early lunch. When it looked at the hollow where we were hiding, its eyes were like two pinpricks of blazing white light. I'm coming, those eyes seemed to say, and there's nowhere to run. Uh, Ted? I shouted over my shoulder. How's it going up there? Good, but you two need to stay there. Why? I was confused. As bait. Ted shouted back. Now, wait a minute. Look, lady, you want to kill this thing? Get out of here or not? Oh, hell no. Bang. I threw myself and Ralphie Jr. to the ground as the loudest noise I'd ever heard blasted down the scooped out canyon. A coyote that had been about to ambush us lay dead in the brush. Ted, it seemed, knew what he was doing. Bang! A yelp. Two more coyotes down. But there stood the largest one, approaching us with an unnatural stride, babbling in that yipping, snarling language to the pack that followed it. There was no way Ted had enough ammo for all of them. I closed my eyes, covered my ears, and for the moment, felt bad that the last thing Ralphie Jr. was going to see was his mom shaking like a fucking bowl of jello. Two more shots made my eyes open. Ted was sliding down the cliff in a cloud of dust. The huge, freakish, two-legged coyote was down. And the pack was scattering. It's not going to stay put for long, Ted snapped. Get some rocks, anything, weigh it down. I didn't want to get any closer to the dark, pointy-eared body, but I did as I was told. I felt like a cave woman creeping up to the thing with a rock in my hand. Is it... My voice was trembling. Is it a skinwalker? Seriously, lady? Ted groaned. I swear you people see one weird thing in the desert. Suddenly it's all skinwalker this, when to go that. It's real disrespectful. Especially when what you're looking at is a possessed guy in a fur suit. Up close, the fur did look pretty artificial. And the name tag Buttercup did a lot for Ted's case as well. Given that Las Vegas is only 80 miles away... Shouldn't even need to ask where the poor fella came from. Although I do wonder how he got a demon inside of him. Hurry up with those rocks. Ted rumbled behind me. It's not done yet. Sure enough, the thing started to writhe on the ground, even with two holes in its chest. And as it yipped and yiffed in that strange language, the coyotes stopped their retreat. One snapped at Ralphie Jr., who swatted it with a stick. Another sprung at Ted. He sprawled, the shotgun went flying, and the pointy-eared black shadow rose to block out the last pale light of sunset. I grabbed the shotgun, and this time, I paid attention to the recoil. The black furred thing went down again, and soon all three of us were heaping everything we could onto it to hold it down. Ted disappeared up to the cave, and when he came back, there was a red gas canister in his hand. As he soaked and burned the possessed thing beneath the rocks, the coyotes howled. The gas can, I muttered. You knew how to kill that thing. You knew about the cave. You knew you'd need some people for bait. Ted turned to me, backlit by our flaming furry barbecue. You picked us up on purpose. None of this was coincidence. Nope, Ted admitted. Sure wasn't. Maybe it was just the firelight, but it sure looked to me like... There was something wrong with Ted's shadow. The forearms were too big, the back bent, the face stretched forward like a muzzle. I'm willing to bet your name's not even Ted Yellowhorse. 
Maybe even that if we open up the trailer of that truck, we'd find the real Ted Yellow Horse lying dead on top of some cartons of baby formula or something. I re-racked the shotgun. I didn't know if it had any shells left, but it sure sounded cool. I heard a snapping sound. Ted's hands were contorted into paws. His arms lengthened sickeningly towards the sandstone. The coyotes fell in line behind him. Salted Earth was ours long before you people ever climbed down from the trees. That one thought it could take our territory. His face extended, and his canines twisted into a hideous smile. We're a lot older, and a lot smarter. That one is drawing too much attention. I took a step backwards and shrieked as I felt warm fur against my leg. We were surrounded. Here's what you're going to do for me, lady. You're going to fire that shotgun into each of the cars down there. You're going to wipe off your prints, put it in the hands of Ted Yellowhorse, who is indeed in the back of the trailer. You're going to tell the police the story of a kidnapping and a psychotic truck driver. Take your time with the story. Make it real good. Because if it isn't, you give them any reason to disturb our hunting grounds again. All the coyotes howled at once. I got the message. Ralphie Jr. and I are going to crash at the motel while I give my statement to the cops and wait for the SUV to get fixed. After that, we're back on the road. Our destination? Any place where there's no sand. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepy Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about two ways to find more stories from this author. How to Build a House, Strange, Unsettling, and Unforgettable Tales, Where Nightmares Dwell, and House with 100 Doors and Other Dark Tales Never Sleep Again, both by Travis Brown, or Grand Theft Motto, the author of tonight's story. And you can find both in the description down below, available now on Amazon. And now, on to tonight's story. I always suspected that my dad's barbershop was haunted. And heck, he used to make that claim himself. A lot of customers, particularly the old-timers, had their own little superstitions, their favorite chairs, and days that they avoided coming in for a haircut. My dad, the barber, was the worst of all, though. The man would only use one particular brand of scissors and another for electric razors. He used regular straight razors a good bit, too, except for one antique blade with a pearl handle that he refused to handle. Most curious of all, Dad would always leave the last chair in the corner empty, no matter how packed the shop got. No one would be seated in that chair. He never told me why, only that it was tradition. Dad passed away a few months back. I found him at the barber shop, slumped in one of the chairs, looking for all the world like he was sleeping. It was never my plan to get into the family business. And as of last spring, I was still in college, working on my degree, but when Dad died, somebody had to take care of the family, so I got the certifications I needed, and I started cutting hair. Luckily, Dad prepped me for years growing up, and I didn't scare away any of the old customers. Not at first. However, I noticed some of the guys looking a little nervous when they came in. Eventually, a few of the regulars began dropping off. I decided to ask Bill, one of my dad's favorite clients, to hang out after work at the shop one day so I could ask his advice. What am I doing wrong, Bill? I asked. What's causing folks to leave? I was sweeping up for the day. The shop closed and quiet. Bill sat in his favorite chair sipping a beer. Well, Joey, I'm glad you asked me to stay late, he replied. I didn't mean to have a word with you reason you're scaring away the old timers is simple. Not respecting your dad's rules. I bristled at that a bit and I leaned my broom against the wall. You say I'm, I'm not doing a good job running my dad's shop? Oh, no, no, no. Bill said, hands held up in a calm gesture. You're doing a great job of cutting hair. You're personable. Everybody likes you. It's just... What? Kid, you're not following the rules. 
You're mixing brands. Using all the chairs. Oh. Uh, superstitious stuff. Bill stood up. Might sound silly to you, but traditions meant a lot to your dad. To all of us. The old guys, at least. We'd just like to see you respect that. I nodded. I told Bill I'd consider it. We shook hands and he left, locking the door behind him at my request. I went back to cleaning up, but Bill's words stuck with me. Dad's favorite straight razor, the one with the pearl handle, was sitting in its usual place of honor next to one of the mirrors in the corner. Starting to gather dust since I wasn't polishing it as much as my dad did. Or at all. I picked up the razor and I opened it. Blade still looked as sharp as ever. I suppressed a chill. I felt like the temperature in the barbershop dropped by 10 degrees in as many seconds. The lights flickered. I heard a squeak and I... I looked in the corner. The last chair, the one my dad always left empty, was facing me. I was positive that I left it turned towards the counter and mirror earlier that day. Maybe the place really is haunted. I muttered, closing the razor and placing it on the shelf. I'd meant the line as a joke, but it came out as almost a question. The barbershop was warming up again, but I began to feel like I wasn't alone. I considered leaving and skipping my usual closing routine. That would be, admittedly, that I was afraid. Though, though my dad's superstitions were more than comfortable little rituals. I went back to cleaning up, polishing the mirrors in front of the chair, and when I reached the last chair in the corner, a special one, I felt a wild urge rise up in me. I sat down. Immediately, the temperature in the room plummeted. I saw my breath come out in a cold, white cloud. There was a tinkling sound. I, I turned to see the pearl-handled razor vibrating on its shelf. Joey. The voice sounded familiar. Terribly, impossibly familiar. I swiveled in my chair until I was facing the mirror. The lights flickered again. In the flash of darkness, I saw my dad's reflection in the mirror standing behind me, except he didn't look entirely like my dad. His face was stretched and blurry, constantly shifting and reforming. After a moment, it clarified and looked like my dad, only... younger. Much younger. He looked like he was my age. I saw his reflection shimmer and turned to look at something towards the front of the shop. Suddenly, I could hear a warble that slowly crystallized into my dad's voice, just like his reflection. The voice was decades younger than the last time I saw him. Sorry, we're closed, I heard him say. I glanced at the razor on the shelf. It was shaking like a box of alarm clocks. I realized that I was shaking too. I, I swallowed a scream. The room was growing colder by the moment. I turned back to the mirror to see frost collecting around the edges. My dad's reflection was still looking away towards the front of the shop. I changed the angle of the chair and saw who he was talking to. A man, very young and skinny, dressed in a moth-eaten hoodie. While I watched, the man pulled out a knife. I saw his mouth move but couldn't hear the words. Still, it was easy enough to guess that this was some kind of robbery, albeit a, a pathetic one. Get out, I heard my dad say. Just get out of here. I saw the handle of the pearl grip razor poking out of my dad's white barber coat. The burglar, barely more than a teen, moved suddenly, but my dad was quicker. It was hard to follow, but there was a spurt of blood that made me duck. I poked my head back up and realized it was only the phantom reflection of blood as seen through the mirror. Now there was a new image. My dad in his white jacket stained red, kneeling over a man that attacked him. Dad was holding the young guy's hand. The burglar's throat ripped open by the razor. The man kept trying to speak, but only blood came out. Dad was crying. In an instant, the mirror was back to normal and the shop was warm again. He stood up, shaking. It was self-defense, I said. It wasn't Dad's fault. But I knew that wouldn't have mattered to my dad. He was a good man, kind. Even if he was justified in taking a life to protect himself, the guilt would have weighed heavy on him. All of Dad's superstitions 
his respect for the razor and leaving a chair open clicked. The seat was a sign of respect for the man who died there on the floor all those years ago. And the razor used as a weapon could never cut hair again. But he wouldn't throw it away. Dad would keep it as a reminder of one of the worst nights of his life. I took a deep breath and I looked back at the chair in the corner. It was facing the counter again and the, the razor with the pearl handle was still. Instead of running out of the barbershop screaming, I went back to cleaning up. I finally understood my dad's superstitions. And I, I'd be sure to honor them in the future. The shop was haunted. But as long as it was treated with respect, I knew it would stay quiet. Then I knew the regulars would come back. Come on, god damn it! Use the power I've given you! Fight back! His spike-knuckled fist slammed into my bare face, sending me flying through the air and into a nearby tree. Despite the tree's time-hardened and hulking form, I went right through it as if it was merely cardboard. I landed roughly, first skidding over some rocks and then tumbling down a slope, coming to rest in a muddy depression several meters away. Entangled in vines and covered in earth and debris, I tossed and turned amidst the muck, terror making me momentarily ignorant to the pain of the thing's Herculanean punch. The sound of the air above whipping in response to the sudden appearance of something only served to hasten my limbs. I managed to regain a semblance of physical coordination and untangle myself, and rising from the ditch quickly, scrambled towards a moss-covered mound, hiding behind it. I asserted the situation and quickly came to the grim realization there was simply nothing I could do. I'd have to either fight back and hope to somehow win, or let it kill me, and hope that the method of death would be quick and painless. The sun, high resting, brilliant and unobscured, seemed to be working against me. There were no substantial shadows in which to hide. All were bathed in an almost mystifying radiance. My attacker needed only to fly past the mound to spot me, with panic rattling in my heart and stifling my breathing. I searched for something. A rock or log or natural club of some kind. One that I could use to strike the thing. Even whilst knowing that, regardless of the object, I'd probably not do any significant damage. Earlier, I had watched it fall from the sky and land on solid rock, cratering the land in the process. A stone, no matter how big, probably wouldn't even scratch it. But still, I had to think of something. A sudden smell, a faint chemical scent of burning, saved me from being bisected by his ocular lasers. I leapt forward, landing flatly on the ground, as a beam of searing, hard light swept above me, just barely missing my scalp. Turning around, I saw the top half of the mound slide a few inches askew, the lingering incision molten, the moss thereon aflame. Hovering a few feet above the mound was the thing, an infernal star-sent nightmare who'd chosen me for his earthen opponent in some sadistic, interspecie bout. You can fight, or you can die, painfully. If you make me break a sweat, I'll end you quickly. You have my word. But if you bore me, I'll take my time. I'll make sure you know true cosmic antipathy. And then, I'll eradicate every civilization on this planet. The fate of the world is in your hands. What are you gonna do? Adrenaline surged as my terror mounted. My muscles, supernaturally endowed with enhanced strength, contracted beneath my skin. My vision blurred as the blood pressure rose, and for a moment I feared that I'd have a heart attack before even throwing a punch. But then an errant breeze blew across my face, and with it came a smell, a whiff of grilled meats. I didn't know from where the smell had come, but knew by its intensity that there were people nearby, relatively speaking. 
My sense of smell had no doubt been heightened, but even a radius of a few miles were close for two beings who could cross entire regions in a few moments. People nearby almost assuredly meant collateral damage. The recognition of this grim fact had a calming effect upon my body and nerves. It was no longer just my life on the line, or the lives of others following my promised demise. There were people here, now, who I needed to protect from the alien gladiator. Through conscious effort, I brought my rampant vitals under control and I rose to stand, considerably less afraid. The grass smoldered around me and the combined heat of the laser-blasted area and the blazing sun drew sweat from my body, dampening my dirt-stained shirt. I must have looked ridiculous standing up at the eight-foot-tall, titan-armored alien, challenging him whilst wearing a t-shirt and sweatpants. But in the moment I felt, for the first time in my life, powerful ready to defend myself against something markedly greater. Knowing that he'd just swat me down if I tried to engage him in the air, I began my assault with a ranged attack of my own. Utilizing my abdominal muscles and pre-natural control of my digestive organs, I channeled a surge of stomach acid and bile from the depths of my gut, spewing it out of my mouth in a green, noxious torrent. His reaction was one of disgust and disbelief. The torrent struck him before he could even react. Probably stunned by the sheer vileness of the attack, he teetered in the air, and I let out another volley, this one even more acrid than the last. It struck him squarely, coating his monstrous insectoid body, and after a moment of mid-air writhing, he fell landward. My esophagus burned. My gums thrummed, but still, I readied myself for a third shot, knowing that it'd take more than some molten vomit to kill the thing. It had landed a few feet behind the split mound. Rounding this, I found the demon rolling around on the ground, slewing off sheets of my vomit. The stuff burned the grass wherever it landed, and the resultant smell was intolerably noxious. My eyes began to water, and my nose, already burning, felt as if it would fall off my face if I didn't filter the stench somehow. Quickly ripping off a part of my sleeve, I wrapped the fabric around my nose and again prepared to unleash another spray. But in the brief lapse of focus, the thing had displaced all the vomit, no doubt through some hypersped motion, and crossed the distance between us in an instant. With its monstrous strength, it promptly punched a hole through my stomach. Blood and bile gushed outward in a brownish admixture as the thing withdrew its fist from my belly. I fell to my knees as a wave of inexpressible agony overcame me, the sensation of having been abdominally penetrated unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. The alien stepped back and admired his work, cackling evilly as I knelt over from the pain and the partial destruction of my spinal cord. My vision went red and swam. The world seemed to distort and upheave around me. Some instinct heretofore unexperienced told me to push. That's the best way I can describe it, and I, I complied, hoping that it would stifle the thought of facing pain. And miraculously, it did. My hands, which I brought to my stomach in an effort to keep some of my guts held within my body, suddenly slipped against a flat surface. Looking down, I saw that my wound had closed. It was only skin. Freshly grown and slick, mostly with sweat. The only blood present being what had coated my hands and rubbed off. The thought, the instinct to push, had allowed me to rapidly regenerate. Good job. You've mastered one of the most basic abilities of your power set. The creature's blatantly sardonic tone infuriated me. Like a hot-headed child who'd just been knocked down by an older sibling, I stood, wiped away what I could of the blood and sweat, and charged at him. My fist connected squarely in his chest. I'd hoped to do to him what he'd done to me, put a hole in his body, only at his heart rather than his stomach. But upon contact with his thickly armored pecs, my hand merely imploded. The fingers collapsing into my palm in a mess of tendons and bone. I cried out before my voice could even carry to the treetops. His hand gripped my throat and I was effortlessly lifted from the ground. Struggling against the strangulation, I tried to kick at him, but his other hand seized my left leg at the kneecap and squeezed. The joint shattered, and this time, a howl did escape me, the air pushing itself through my constricted throat. He laughed loudly and cruelly, his voice even rising to drown out my own. 
Dismissively, he then chucked me away like a piece of trash, and I fell face first onto the ground not far from where I'd initially landed following his super punch. My entire body throbbed, the twofold agonies of my injuries, despite my superhuman physical resilience. He was just so much stronger. He could inflict more damage than I could physically or psychologically endure. Get up. Heal yourself or I'll set this entire forest ablaze. His demonic voice, more than the sinister words themselves, gave me the motivation I needed. There was nothing but evil in those tones, an utter lack of humanity. It was the voice of one who had, elsewhere on other, remoter worlds, inflicted unfathomable terrors and obscenities upon helpless populaces. The same impulse of pushing I had used before, I autonomously and simultaneously repaired my crushed windpipe and my busted kneecap. The restoration brought its own measure of pain, but I gritted my teeth against it, and I rose to my feet. His jet-black body glistened in the sunlight, like some man-sized, futuristically armored bat. His face, saw-toothed and infinitely ghoulish, gazed at me with an expression of open malice, of satanic mirth. It filled me with rage, horror, and indignation all at once. And I would have abruptly and, no doubt, uselessly charged at him again, but a memory providently recalled, stayed my hand, and I at last realized how I could defeat the super-powered Incubus. Earlier in the day I'd been hiking along a well-worn trail on a short jaunt not far from my home, whilst rounding a bend in the trail, beside which was a steep cliff, its edge perilously unguarded, I spotted the creature falling from the upper atmosphere, trailing a plume of pitch-black smoke in its wake. It landed at the base of the cliff, cratering a land there, and after only a few moments, rose and flew up into the air, apparently having suffered no major injuries from its atmospheric entry. Had I been a little slower to the point in my hike, I would have been spared the subsequent endowment of power and violence. But during his ascent, he had spotted me standing there, dumbstruck, and proceeded to alter his course towards my direction, and thus, thus began the terrifying ordeal. But one thing I hadn't consciously taken notice of, one thing I only recalled when standing face to face with that dark armored nightmare was the nature of his flight, the mechanism by which it was achieved. It lacked wings and seemed to accomplish flight by exerting some sort of telekinetic force upon itself, or just as supernaturally by manipulating gravity so that it suddenly became lighter than air in some fashion. Regardless, its body, or rather, two small, unshielding portions of its lower abdomen would briefly glow upon the activation of the flight ability. Seeing this as it prepared to rise again and rain some new power of death upon me, I got the idea to clog those fortuitously unprotected orifices. Just as its savagely taloned feet left the earth, I again summoned from the depths of my bowels a potent surge of bile, and this time internally honing and sharpening the stream so it would spew forth precisely rather than in great torrential showers. Using my tongue as a divider, the flesh of it naturally impervious to the ascetic effects, I split the stream in two, sending dual blasts towards each of the orange-tinged holes in the creature's body. The stream struck true, and the fiend cried out, shocked and agonized. He was immediately grounded. Figuratively, de-winged. I let off the oral assault just as I began to feel woozy, probably from exhorting too much of my gastrointestinal energies. The creature writhed on the ground, my bile burning away at its insides. I watched appalled and awed as his chitinous armor expanded, the flesh beneath swelling and inflaming. A moment later, in a great shower of bits and iridescent blood, the thing exploded. Bile, blood, and black flesh glistened in the radiance of the now midday sun, I took in the grisly scene as one gazing upon the twinkling surface of a calm lake. I had somehow beaten the creature in its own gladiatorial game. I knew that I couldn't simply let the foul remains of that extraterrestrial asshole linger. I mean, who knows what effects the awful might have on the environment or the bolder carrion animals. 
So with one final all-enveloping spew, I douse the whole area in my acrid bile, melting all evidence of the creature's heinous existence. Toxic smoke rose from the dissolving gore, blackening the surrounding foliage. Stinging my eyes as I turned and left. Superpowers were forced upon me. And using them, I fought a powerful alien horror. And won. The Earth is safe, I suppose. For now. Who's the worst, most despicable person you can think of? Jeffrey Dahmer? Ted Bundy? Luis Garavito? Pol Pot? Of course, you can make your own arguments for any of them. Or anybody else, for that matter. Yet, all these people have one thing in common. They're human. Preposterous people trying to act like monsters either due to lofty, ridiculous ideals or some primal urge to revolt against society as a whole. It's quite a bizarre phenomenon that none of these admittedly sick people have truly fallen into the abyss. Perhaps they've stared down into it, dipped their feet in, but none of them have taken the plunge as a whole. Despite their efforts, they weren't able to separate themselves from their inherent humanity. That's a good thing. They're relatively easy to take down. The bad news is that every once in a while, special cases will arise. In our circles, we call these individuals the Void People, or just Voids. Individuals so far gone that they can hardly be considered humans anymore. The cause behind entities like this? Well, I wouldn't know. Nobody really does. Maybe they were born with that latent potential. Maybe they underwent some obscure supernatural transformation. Maybe their experiments gone awry. Aliens from another planet. Shit. Maybe they're literal demons from hell brought here by some fool who just had to conduct some fucked up rituals. Who the hell knows? The only detail that matters is the fact that they exist, and dealing with them is more than a bitch. I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of max security prisons, places where drug kingpins, terrorists, and prolific serial killers exist or sent. The place is meant to contain the worst amongst humans. Well, those are a joke compared to where the voids are kept that a pair of undisclosed coordinates built in the underground of a tiny island somewhere deep in the Atlantic. There exists a prison unlike anything you can imagine. We simply call it the Chasm, a penitentiary for pure, unbridled evil, a collective evil that would surely yield humanity's extinction in a couple of months if it were allowed to run rampant in the world. Let me emphasize this a bit further. The individuals that require being held there are not merely criminally insane. They are criminally, absolutely, out of this universe fucking bonkers. Of course, you wouldn't know about any of this. I mean, why would you? The government would probably sacrifice a thousand children before they divulge a single detail about the place to a person without high enough clearance. But you know, that's just how they are. Before I came, there were exactly 32 beings confined there, save for two that were still being actively pursued through the Brazilian underground and Russian tundra, respectively. That was about all of them in the world. At least, we assume that was all of them. Can't be sure about anything these days. Each holding cell was fortified to hell, specifically designed to counter and contain the respective void they were hiding. If they managed to escape, there were eight drones armed with Gatling guns, blades, grenades, and rockets waiting for them within a larger chamber. If they managed to break through that, then twenty guards in mechanized suits would have stepped in. However, everybody understood the futility of that protocol. Those guards were getting slaughtered in seconds, regardless of the void they were up against. Maybe minutes if they were really skilled. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure why any of us regular guards are stationed here at all. Bureaucracy, I guess. Who knows what the government's thinking. 
If the situation were to ever get too drastic, then there was really only one feasible countermeasure in place. The last resort, so to speak. The higher-ups would have to call in something known as Task Force Void Nova Hammer, or TFVNH for short. I've never seen them in action before, nor do I know much about them. Not that I really want to, though. If you ever find yourself witnessing them in person, then that must mean that you're having a bad, bad day. So why am I disclosing all of this uber-classified information that would either get me killed or thrown in the deepest hole conceivable for the rest of my short life? Well, I'd estimate that there's about a 90% chance I'm going to die by the end of today. And even if I do make it out of this fiasco, my life's never really going to be the same. So fuck it. Here we go. My day started out more or less normal. I was part of the unit guarding somebody named Jim Henninger. Well, that was his real name. Doesn't invoke a lot of fear, does it? That's why we had to call him something else. Since he used to be some psycho surgeon or something, we dubbed him the surgeon. Really creative stuff, I know. Standing at five foot seven, 135 pounds, we were all required to memorize their physical stats. It doesn't look like much. However, if you ever find yourself in the same room with him, no matter how big and tough you are, you're getting dissected or something. The main danger surrounding him stems from the fact that he seems to be able to teleport on will. One second you'll be staring at his dark, lifeless eyes, and after one blink, he'll disappear in a cloud of black haze, only to end up breathing right back down your neck. And for that reason, there's got to be at least ten sets of eyes on his monitor at all times. There's no way around it. He's not being watched. He will escape. He's also kind of unkillable. No matter how many bullets you put through his head or blades you plunge in his chest, the guy just won't croak. And once he gets a scalpel in his hands, oh boy. Of course, he's just one out of 32 and, comparatively speaking, on the tamer side. With that said, my guard shift ended without any incidents. Routine stuff. Following that, I went on a break in the lunchroom with my buddy Sandu. Conversations are usually pretty dry, but at least I can talk to the guy. It's hard to get along with any of the other guards. They're all just weird, one way or another. Anyway, lunch was usually the most enjoyable part of a working day in the chasm. What I didn't enjoy was the blaring fucking alarm and deafening, repeating automated voice blasting the word breach that went off right as I was about to take my chili out of the microwave. I could see Sandu's face drop at the disturbance. You're fucking kidding me, he mouthed. Now I'd only ever experienced one minor breach up until that point, and it was from the surgeon. I guess none of us were paying any attention that day. He made it about eight miles off the coast using a stolen boat, racking up a total body count of 145 in his wake. It took three full days to wrangle him back, and four more weeks to fix all the damage he'd done to the infrastructure. That was all just for one prisoner. If we were dealing with three or more, then our combined efforts as guards wouldn't have stood a semblance of a chance. There had only ever been one major breach in the chasm's history, in which eight voids had broken out nearly simultaneously. It was also, apparently, the only time that TFVNH had to step in. This was all around twelve years ago, long before I became a guard myself. The aftermath of that, I don't have high enough clearance to know, but I'm willing to bet it was nothing fun. We did have a breach procedure. It was a lengthy document outlining exactly what we were supposed to do and where we were supposed to go. I've read it before and it's fucking garbage. It's essentially predicated on the idea that we're cannon fodder and that we're obligated to do whatever we can do to contain the prisoners. If anybody actually followed the procedure, they'd die instantly. Well, what the hell are we supposed to do? Someone asked. They only got a shrug in response. Except for Swanson, that was. Fucking hated Swanson. The guy seemed to believe that his life's an action movie and that he's the invincible main protagonist. Are y'all pussies or what? He screamed at the top of his lungs with a stupid grin plastered across his face. We never get any fucking action. Let's fucking go! Before anybody could stop him, he picked up his rifle and swung the door open like the giant fucking dumbass that he is. Since the alarm was blaring, we could hardly hear anything that was going on outside the corridors. For that reason, we were all rather shocked upon seeing Morgie the Corgi standing right outside. 
Imagine some guy walking around wearing a dirty, giant, creepy dog costume. Now imagine that this guy is seven foot two, with a voice that's simultaneously deep, raspy, and childish. That's Morgie the Corgi for you. I could see the bravado leaving Swanson's face the moment he laid eyes on the abomination in person. We'd only ever seen him through a screen before. Roof! I always hated it when people tried imitating dogs, but hearing it come from Morgie was a bit different, and a lot worse. Before Swanson could even put his finger on the trigger, his head was smashed into pulp. Morgie began pouncing on other guards, effortlessly crushing their limbs with his oversized paws. He'd switch between running around on his feet and crawling on all fours. The last thing I saw before running out of the break room was Morgie forcing the remaining horrified agents to play fetch with him, using a stray arm. But of course, it's not like I managed to escape anywhere better. The entire place was in a fucking tizzy. The squad leaders were frenetic, attempting to scrape together some kind of suppression force. I couldn't understand why they were so delusional. Are we guards supposed to be badass? Fuck yeah. Due to our field prowess, we were specifically selected from the existing pool of CIA agents and military personnel to be dropped into this godforsaken place. Put us up against a trafficking militia, terrorists, etc. We'll smoke them. But what we can't deal with are things that aren't supposed to exist in the first place. We watch creature features and slasher fix with the inherent understanding that we're watching fiction, a type of visual catharsis for our inherent fascination with the dark and grim. It's not supposed to be real. And we have no idea how to act once we find it standing right in front of our faces. Not even us so-called elite agents, like I said. I'm, I'm not sure why they even bothered keeping guards in the chasm to begin with. These were the thoughts that ran through my head as I bolted through the hellish corridors. At one point, I stumbled upon a crowd of guards leering over some rails. Shockingly, they didn't seem concerned in the slightest. What the hell are you guys looking at? I asked them. A guard I recognized as Fenton turned around. This is gonna suck, he grinned, gesturing for me to look below. I didn't even know where I was going, so I didn't realize that I'd wandered into the level right above the weight room. There was a sprawling gym with an abundance of the best equipment obtainable. But there was one guard that used it the most. Bronko Petrovic. A Serbian-American whose oversized frame hardly makes any fucking sense. I swear, when I first met the guy, he couldn't have been over seven feet. He's around eight foot two now. I'm not quite sure what kind of bizarre experiments they ran on him, but he sure as hell overdid it. Despite the alarms, he was in the middle of overhead pressing what appeared to be an ungodly amount of weight when one of the escaped voids wandered onto the weight room floor. It was Luz, standing at six foot two, two 205 pounds. Like all the other prisoners, the guy was a complete mystery. His mostly bare body was comparable to that of a bodybuilder's, save for the hundreds of gnarled scars decorating his skin. The more disconcerting part of his aesthetic was the fact that he only had one half of his face. The other half consisted of his exposed skull, with some kind of red electrical current running through his cranial bones. He had the same current running through his hands, which allowed him to savagely electrocute whatever organic material he touched, quickly rendering it into a pile of steaming black mush. I guess that my fellow agents didn't bother reading up on the prisoners they guarded, because Bronco never stood a chance. It didn't matter if you were superior to lose in terms of strength. One touch and you were gone. The only practical way to take him down was by using ranged weapons, and even then, that task was easier said than done. Bronco grunted like the dumb meathead that he was before grabbing an Olympic weightlifting plate and chucking it like a frisbee at lose. It connected, seemingly shattering his ribs, but it wasn't nearly enough to take him down. As soon as he rushed forward, the fight had been decided. Bronco attempted to tackle him, a mistake so horrible, his whole body began twitching as his skin made contact with Luz's fingertips. The electricity spread through his giant frame, causing his vitals to shut down within seconds. In no time at all, he was reduced to a heaping mass of scorched flesh on the floor. He didn't even have time to scream. I could see the respective faces of my stunned colleagues drop as they witnessed what they likely deemed as an improbable outcome. Idiots that they were. But truth be told, I was also an idiot for even bothering to stay. Not long after, the sounds of crackling bones and heavy footsteps began emanating from an adjacent hallway, along with the rest of the agents. My gaze shifted towards what was sure to be another incoming menace. 
The locked metal doors to the corridor were suddenly dented from the other side. A big fucking dent, mind you. It only took one more blow to blast it off its hinges completely. Standing at six foot six and 242 pounds, and arriving in a haze of blood, guts, and limbs, was the slasher flick S killer, colloquially known as Wirehead. In congruence with his name, his entire head, save for a single eye, was wrapped in rusty barbed wire. He wore a decrepit old leather jacket and jeans, complete with a large pompadour on top, like an 80s or whatever, high school delinquent. Everybody's main concern was the weapon in his hands. A large iron bat, wrapped in the same barbed wire on his head. If you didn't die from the impact, which was unlikely, the subsequent infection would surely get you. And don't ask us why we didn't take his weapon away when we contained him. We did. But somehow, some way, we got it back. These things really can't be helped. What the hell's going on, I thought. Breaches happened, sure, but it seemed as if every single fucking void had somehow escaped. How is that possible? In any case, I couldn't afford to think deep into this at the moment. As Wirehead began mowing down the mystified agents in his way, I found myself accidentally making eye contact with Luz from below. I nearly had a heart attack as I began pushing through the crowd, even though I was implicitly certain of the fact that no other location within the chasm would have been much safer. I was still being driven ahead by my fight-or-flight responses, away from the immediate threat. It was kind of funny. I'd been through so many life-or-death experiences that my reaction to adrenaline coursing through my veins had been dulled. Well, it sure as hell got invigorated today. I guess I wasn't paying enough attention to my surroundings, because right as I was about to climb a staircase, I felt an oversized arm slam into my chest, knocking me over in the process. I looked up to see another guard. Cade leering down at me. Sure, I was happy it wasn't one of my voids, but Cade wasn't much more pleasant. What are you running for? He shot me a smug grin. There's a breach, isn't it? Why don't we do our jobs here and fix it? Oh, fuck off, I spat at him before trying to duck past. No luck there. He caught me by the collar and slammed me into a wall. He certainly had the weight advantage. Still, I hadn't practiced hand-to-hand -hand combat just to be a rag doll by some asshole. I slammed my elbow down on his wrist, which managed to loosen his grip. I followed up with a knee to the stomach and then attempted to strike his neck. But then he caught my wrist mid-punch. Nice moves, he said in an obnoxiously sarcastic tone. He took his palm and rammed it into my chin, nearly causing me to black out. In the meantime, Wirehead was getting closer. Guess we'll have to take this up another time, he said. Somebody's got to work around here. I had no idea what he was talking about. I had no idea what he was thinking trying to take on one of the voids, but I wasn't trying to see his delusions through in person. Still in pain from his palm strike, I pulled myself up and began running once more, all while the sound of carnage escalated around me. But there was a glaring issue. I had no idea where I was going. The exits were surely going to be blocked off in the inside. But we have some kind of safe room, I thought to myself. Do we have some kind of safe room, I thought to myself. No, of course we didn't. We were entirely expendable. They 100% expected us to fight these things head on, even though there was zero fucking chance of victory on our side. There was only one thing I could do here. Survive until TFV and H showed up. Obviously, that wasn't any kind of guaranteed reprieve, but my options were slim. Nevertheless, something rather surprising transpired. Amidst the cacophony of frenetic orders from our supervisors, a familiar voice snuck in through my radio. Hey, Jason. You... alive? It was Sandu. I picked up my radio and isolated his transmission. Yeah. Where are you, man? Block C. Got lucky. Found something weird. Might save us, though. Come on. Obviously, there wasn't much information there, but it was better than running around aimlessly. Thankfully, Block C was fairly close, so I was able to make it without running into another void. However, when I got there, it was still as chaotic as ever. I swiveled my head around, trying to spot Sandu. I yelled in my radio, but his response was drowned out by everything around me. As I searched, I began sensing a perplexing, sinister pressure that made it feel as if I was sinking into the concrete beneath me. I hardly had to guess the source. It was Diaxic. Nine foot five. Who knows how many pounds. Diaxic was compared in appearance to something you'd see in the corner of your room during sleep paralysis. 
a hulking, faceless figure wearing a sweeping black robe that jerked around in unsettling motions as he or she, who knows, walked. I wasn't sure how he actually killed people, mind you. As soon as anybody got within a certain distance to him, they'd freeze in place and begin bleeding from their eyes, and then they'd just stay that way forever. Obviously, that wasn't something I was looking forward to. As I looked ahead, I could see unfortunate guards already getting caught in his death zone. In an attempt to avoid a similar fate, I turned the opposite direction and began running. And then I nearly shit myself. Standing about ten feet away was the undead Nazi. Five foot eight and 143 pounds. His name essentially told it all. A man wearing a dirty and tattered SS uniform with a cracked gas mask covering his face. In one hand, he gripped his signature Kompfmesser 42 blade that was inexplicably unbreakable, no matter what the hell he was trying to do with it. In the other, he held a flamethrower hose connected to a massive tank on his back, which sprayed out some kind of scorching black flame that would supposedly yield pain beyond comprehension, if you were ever to come in contact with it. You could say that I was stuck between a rock and a hard place here. The only other way out was taking the plunge over the rail in front of me, onto a mass of scrambling bodies 50 feet below. Before I considered simply saying my prayers, I felt a hand tug at my sleeve from the side, giving me another heart attack, but this time it was good news, for once. I looked over to see Sandu poking his head out from what appeared to be some kind of hidden door in the wall. Let's fucking go, he whisper shouted before pulling me in. He closed the door behind him, plunging us into complete darkness. The hell is this place? I asked, hardly expecting a detailed response. Sandu illuminated his face by using his phone's flashlight. Couldn't tell you. But it's kind of fucking crazy. I could hear the Nazi beginning to spray his flamethrower from out in the corridor. I suddenly wondered whether or not Gaiaxis' power would apply to other voids. In any case, it was better not to be in such close vicinity to them. So I followed Sandu. He led me down some kind of hidden hallway. The walk was rather long, maybe around eight minutes and I eventually found myself in what appeared to be some kind of surveillance or control room. It was still dark, but there was an array of monitors giving off enough light to comfortably navigate around. But here's the strange thing. The place looked kind of haphazard. No chance it was being used by the higher-ups. The monitors were scattered around, connected by a mess of wires to multiple outlets spread throughout the room. There was also only one chair. I guess this is beyond explaining, I said. Yeah. No shit, huh? Sandy replied, before gesturing towards the monitors. Check it out. What the fuck did we just find? I took the suggestion, letting my eyes drift over to the screens. What I saw would have been normal in any other scenario. Each monitor was streaming a different section of the prison, all displaying the utter carnage that was going on outside. The guards were being ripped to shreds. Some tried fighting. Most were running. But what they had in common was the fact that they were all being utterly obliterated by the voids. I could see the surgeon giving somebody a forced lobotomy, grinning like hell while doing so. At the same time, Morgi was chewing on a severed head like a toy. But then I caught something interesting on the screen below. It was Wirehead and Luz, staring each other down. That's when a rather obvious revelation hit me. Of course, the voids weren't only going to kill guards. They were sure as hell going after each other as well. That much should have been apparent from the beginning. I, I grinned, feeling some kind of obscure hope creeping into my system. That hope was only bolstered when I saw the Nazi utterly dousing Diaxic with a relentless wave of black flames, with the latter struggling to move forward as a result. Guess these bastards can be hurt after all, I thought to myself. But of course, my hope was merely transistory. I wasn't going to kid myself. Even if only one void was left standing at the end of everything, that just means it will be the strongest out of all of them. And we can't stay in here forever. At this point, my future is uncertain at best. Maybe I'll get lucky. Probably not. But in the meantime, I suppose I'll enjoy the show. See how things turn out to be continued. This place sure gives you the creeps, doesn't it? I couldn't agree with Sandu's assessment of the bizarre room we found ourselves in. 
The monitors only illuminated the area up until a certain point. However, we couldn't see any walls, which meant the place had to be bigger than what we could have seen. Either by a little or by a lot. We couldn't know unless we decided to venture further into the darkness. Neither of us took that initiative, though, keeping it a mystery. Still, it didn't feel like anybody was in there with us, so we allowed ourselves to relax a bit. I took the first sitting shift, lying back in the chair and focusing on the monitor that I deemed most interesting at the moment. Wirehead versus Ludes. Who was I rooting for? None of them. Nevertheless, I was morbidly eager to see the two horrific titans square off. Among us guards, we'd created an unofficial tier system, ranking each respective void in terms of the estimated threat that they posed in comparison to each other. The tiers went as such, Tornado being the weakest, Tsunami, Hurricane, which is about mid, Earthquake, and Asteroid, which is the highest imminent death get the fuck out level. They were also divided into subdivisions, high, low, mid, etc. With that said, Luz was around a high tornado, while Wirehead was a mid-tsunami. The glaring difference between them, but not enough that would make it impossible for Luz to win. You want to make a bet? I asked Sandu, half-jokingly. He chuckled. I know my luck's cursed, but I guess if we don't make it out of here alive, then my debt's null anyway. Luz was more of a defensive combatant. So it wasn't surprising when Wirehead initiated the conflict. He twirled his bat around, still with remnants of guard flesh clinging to it, in a near mocking fashion at Luz. He was a delinquent, after all. Luz hardly reacted, of course. That's just the way that he was. In response, he stepped forward, electricity flickering through his hands and up to his forearms, Wirehead following suit, unleashing a big swing at Luz's head, which he managed to intercept with one of his forearms. Nevertheless, the wire still pierced his skin. Wirehead followed it up with a headbutt. This time, it connected with the flesh side of Luz's face, slicing him up rather gruesomely. But despite his seemingly grievous injuries, he remained unwavering. This was the thing about Luz. He was incapable of feeling any pain. Like I said, his exact origins remained a mystery, but the one thing we knew about him for sure was the fact that he hailed from some kind of ancient clan residing in the Arctic Circle. In fact, he was the sole survivor of an incident that decimated his village, and he was hungry for revenge against the unknown force that did it. After taking the headbutt, Luz was now in striking range. He formed his fingers into an arrow shape and drove them into Wirehead's solar plexus before electrocuting his insides. Wirehead quaked in pain as he swung his bat in a frenzied rage, just about demolishing Luz's ribcage. No reaction from him, though. Instead, he took his other hand and wrapped it around Wirehead's neck. Any normal person would have succumbed to Luz's electrical shocks after a few seconds. But of course, Wirehead was no normal person. Despite blood pouring out of his chest wound and his skin on his neck beginning to bubble, he picked Luz up by the torso and slammed him over the steel railing. He fucking broke his back. Even without sound, the mental audio of a spine snapping reverberated throughout my mind. Unsurprisingly, Luz didn't bat an eye. Wirehead went in for the kill, tossing Luz's body onto the ground before smashing until it resembled nothing more than a mess of bloody pulp and broken bones. But somehow, he was still alive. Among the gruesome pile, I could see an eye blink. Once Wirehead had exhausted himself from his relentless swinging, Luz took his chance. Using one arm that hadn't been smashed to bits, he crawled over and grabbed Wirehead by the foot before scaling him up to his neck. Once there, he drilled his fist into Wirehead's forehead, utterly shattering his own hand in the process. In the end, it was worth a sacrifice. He was able to electrocute Wirehead's brain, finally causing the behemoth to drop. So, I guess he won? Sandu asked. I guess. I had my own reservations about calling Luz's performance a victory. By the end of it, all of his limbs and his spine had been shattered, and not an inch of his body wasn't hosting a series of deep cuts. The good side of his face had also been chipped away to the skull, leaving only his eye and half of his nose intact. And yet, he didn't move. 
with a hint of desperation or concern, calmly crawling away from the scene using his one mangled hand. I could still see the current flowing through it as well, a telltale sign that he was ready to pick up another fight. Nice. Come back, Victory, Sandu said. I don't see him making it far, though. Not as a tornado tear. Yeah, but we made all that shit up. Not like it means anything, I responded. Truth be told, I was nearly rooting for Luz at the end there. Something about his resilience resonated with me, as bizarre as it may sound. I scanned the rest of the monitors. While Wirehead and Luz were squaring off, the undead Nazi had burnt Diaxic to a crisp. On another monitor, Morgi playing around with a void corpse that I recognized as Death Shadow. He chose his own name. Three down, I muttered to myself. Fuck, we got a big one coming up, Sandu announced. I followed his eyes to a monitor near the bottom of the room. He was right. This one was going to be good. Standing at opposite sides of the kitchen were Trench, 6 foot 3, 190 centimeters and 330 pounds, and Senju, 5 foot 10 and 148 pounds. Trench was a silent entity dressed entirely in ancient looking deep sea diving gear, except for his head, which remained without a helmet. However, you couldn't get a glimpse of his face regardless. It was due to the fact that his features were completely distorted. So much so that if you tried focusing on the details, all you were going to get was a nasty migraine. On top of that, he was invisible in person. Let me explain. If he were standing right in front of you, you wouldn't be able to see him. The only way to get a glimpse of him was through secondary means, cameras, mirrors, etc., which made him all the more dangerous. As for how he killed people, it was... It was either A, by brute force, using his monstrous strength, or B, his death aura, as us guards had dubbed it. Similar to Diax's zone, once you were in his close vicinity, you'd feel an astronomical amount of pressure and get crushed on the spot. Comparable to what you'd feel standing at the bottom of the ocean. But that's only if Trench wills it. Sometimes, he'll turn the aura off and simply punch somebody's head off. For that reason... He was in the mid-hurricane tier. As for Senju, well, he was basically a psychotic, demon-possessed martial artist with supernatural levels of speed, strength, and agility. He apparently trained in the Wraith style, or the technique beyond human comprehension. Whatever the hell those are supposed to mean. When he gets serious, his eyes will roll into the back of his head, and black veins will begin bulging from underneath his skin. At that point, he'll be moving so fast that his motions become impossible to keep up with visually, and a single punch from him will be enough to completely vaporize a human head. But in all honesty, he's one of the least malicious voids out of the bunch. If you're weak, like us guards, he won't even spare you a glance, granted that you stay out of his way. The only thing that he's really looking for are strong opponents to fight. But when he can't find one, he starts to get antsy. And then, problems emerge. We've pegged him as a low hurricane. Can Senju even see Trench? Sandu asked. I guess so, I responded. The question was worth asking, but I wouldn't have been surprised if Trench's aura or invisibility simply didn't work on him at all. It seemed to be the case, and Senju decided to strike first. He rushed forward at an unfathomable speed, directing what must have been hundreds of strikes in succession to Trench. However, none of them phased the obscure diver. I could see Senju's lips curling into a psychotic grin at the fact he certainly found what he was looking for. The floor beneath him cracked as his eyes turned white and his grotesque veins began bulging. If we couldn't see his strikes before, it was beyond impossible now. He rushed forward, unleashing a maelstrom of lightning-like punches, elbows, and kicks against Trench. This went on for about five seconds before he was stopped in his tracks. Trench had grabbed him by the throat, still not looking any worse for wear in the process. I could see Senju's mouth, something to the effect of what the fuck, before he was tossed into a metal fridge. It certainly appeared as if Trench was too much of a tank for him to handle. Nevertheless, Senju got back up and cracked his shoulder into place while blood leaked from his mouth, and then he seemed to let out a shriek. Crazy fucker, I thought to myself. What the hell did it take for somebody to become like this? At that point, he'd seemingly given up on technique entirely. Instead, he grabbed a handful of kitchen knives and began chucking them at Trench. 
While none of them pierced the suit, one of them managed to stick in his distorted head, which evidently dealt some damage. Trench flinched before taking the knife out and throwing it back at Senju, who in turn caught it effortlessly. At this point, he was howling in what I assumed to be some kind of fucked up pseudo-masochist jubilation. He found the weak point. Senju rushed back at Trench, knife in hand, before slashing away at his face. Spurts of viscous, dark blue blood stained the kitchen floor, along with Senju's own face. And soon enough, the knife snapped, and Trench threw a desperation punch at Senju's temple. He managed to block it with his forearm, although I could see his bones cracking from the impact. He leapt back as his arm hung limp to his side, dodging a follow-up haymaker. Throughout everything, a grin remained plastered on his face. His veins were bulging out so hard I found it hard to believe they weren't going to completely burst altogether. With one arm, Senju lifted a metal table and swung it into the side of Trench's head, nearly taking it off in the process. He wasted no time grabbing a large frying pan and pouncing at his incapacitated opponent, knocking them both over in the process. He then took a position atop Trench's body, furiously slamming the pan onto his face. Uh, martial arts, eh? I could hear Senju mutter. After what must have been 250 blows, the pan broke. Trench's head had been obliterated nonetheless than 50 strikes prior. Sanju tossed the scrap metal aside and looked up at the ceiling, presumably screaming his lungs sore in sheer combative delight. Oh, looks like our tear system means fuck all, I chuckled. Despite the morbid scene unfolding in front of us, Sanju shared a laugh with me. We were at the point where the absolute absurdity and danger of the situation was beginning to fade from our senses. Hell, I suppose we were enjoying ourselves. As fucked up as that might sound. We kept watching as Senju got up and stumbled around, evidently disoriented from both his injuries and successive fits of fighting spirit-induced rage euphoria. He took about four steps before his head exploded, throwing the two of us watching for quite the loop. Another figure stepped into the frame, whom we recognized as Satan Bot. Six foot eleven... 535 pounds. I felt a shiver crawl down my spine upon seeing him, somewhat snapping me back into reality. Despite his comical name, Satan Bot had to be one of the most frightening voids out there. Couldn't understand what the fuck he was supposed to be. His body appeared to be robotic, but moved in ways that were too fluid for even the most sophisticated android. Like, legitimate metallic flesh. It was honestly maddening to look at. On top of that, he literally resembled the fucking devil himself. Reddish black scaly skin, metallic shell, a mouth full of exposed razor-like teeth, rectangular slanted crimson eyes, a pair of large mechanical wings, and a long tail ending in something that resembled a three-pronged spear to boot. For whatever reason, he also had a rocket launcher atop his right shoulder, and a Gatling gun connected to his left hand. No, these were not mechanical modifications. They were literally connected to his body. He was unanimously considered one of the most dangerous voids residing in the chasm, rated at a high earthquake. Even if Senju was at his full strength, he wouldn't have stood a chance. Oh shit, Sandu commented. I was hoping he didn't escape. Well, let's not worry about him for now, I said, turning my attention to another monitor. What my eyes landed on next was utter massacre. Sitting atop a pile of guard bodies that must have eclipsed six feet was Hugo Wright, also known as the Brutal Bishop, six foot two, two hundred pounds. Like his name indicated, he was dressed in a traditional vicar priest outfit. The only difference was the fact that the cross he wore around his neck was fashioned out of blades. The man himself had long, sweeping black hair and about 14 bags under both his dead blue eyes. It was unclear to us what his real motivations were. It's not like he really followed the rules of any religion on Earth. Despite his outfit, he just went on long rants about the sins of naturalism and the futility of existence. And how, to reach a state of sanctity, he must first reach a clean state. Basically, he wanted to kill every sentient being on Earth, and then himself. He wasn't all talk, either. He was certainly strong. We rated him as a low hurricane. After praying to whatever fucked up deity he worshipped atop his pile of corpses, he slid down and began stalking the corridors for some more victims to fulfill his holy objective. Who he came across next 
Couldn't have been more perfect. Kale Silva, also known as Vampire Cop. Five foot nine, 176 pounds. Kale was rather interesting, being that he was one of the most cooperative voids. In fact, he was the only prisoner that willingly turned himself in. His backstory was interesting as well, and of the few we actually knew about. He used to be a prolific, merciless Brazilian cop who patrolled the most dangerous parts of Rio. It was so much so that he earned a reputation amongst the criminal underground as the Reaper. But he was still only human. During one fateful mission, his entire unit was massacred during an ambush attack by about a dozen distinct gangs who were all unified under the same goal of taking him down. He was the only survivor but was captured in the process. After being brutally tortured in a warehouse for about five hours, the lights suddenly went out. During this period of darkness, the only sounds entering his ears were those of carnage. Every single gang member was being obliterated by some unknown force. And at the end of the bloodbath, he could hear footsteps slowly approaching him, before a deep, raspy voice whispered something into his ear. There's potential in you. Allow me to bestow you with an opportunity. He felt a sharp pain in his neck before the hidden entity spoke to him again. Fulfill your duty. And then he passed out. When he woke up, he found himself in his bed, with all the wounds from his torture session just about healed. All wounds except for one. A bite mark on his neck. His appearance had also changed drastically. Pale skin, dark eyes, and fangs. He had heard about the stories, but could hardly comprehend that he'd become one himself. While he couldn't handle being exposed to the sun anymore, he found himself with superhuman strength and regeneration, which he used to brutalize criminals at night as a vigilante. However, it didn't take long for him to go too far. One night, he went to a frenzy, breaking into the house of a suspected rapist and killing everyone inside. Everyone, including the rapist's innocent mother and daughter. His resolve in regards to justice had never wavered, remaining strong no matter what he went through. For that reason, he could hardly live with guilt on his conscience, and walking to the police station he used to work at, turning himself in to his former colleagues that thought he was dead. Of course, the news spread quickly, and that's when the CIA stepped in and transferred him over to the chasm. He put up no resistance. In fact, he deemed the chasm a place where he 100% belonged. Safe to say, he was a rather bizarre case. We still put him in low hurricane, same as Hugo. On the monitor, I could see Kale's lips moving. Wanting to hear what he had to say, I began looking around to see if I could get some audio. It didn't take too long for me to find the volume control panel, which was located right under the middle desk. Thankfully, whoever set this weird place up took the liberty of labeling each switch with its respective monitor. I turned the volume up right in the middle of Kale's spiel. Dangerous scum. I'm going to have to dispose of you all before it's too late. Hugo's face remained expressionless. Scum. An apt description of the ones residing in this place. But I understand that you're also a man wrought with unforgivable sin. I'll treat you no differently, he responded. Kale chuckled. Wouldn't expect you not to. He took a provocative fighting stance. Come on, Englishman. Let's settle this. Hugo put a hand on his bladed cross before muttering another prayer to himself. He looked up at Kale, his eyes now a deep crimson. The atrocities I commit are only in the pursuit of ultimate holiness. I hope you can understand that. Kale grinned. Yeah, I get it. Crazy people are crazy. As he finished the sentence, he rushed forward in a quick blur, sinking his fangs into Hugo's neck. In turn, Hugo grabbed Kale's head and twisted, snapping his neck in what would have been the most gruesome manner feasible, before plunging a fist into his chest. For the first time, Hugo grimaced. What's wrong with your heart? He asked before attracting his hand, revealing severe burn marks. Kale twisted his head back into place before soothing Hugo. Huh. Kale twisted his neck back into place before shooting Hugo a bloody grin. Couldn't tell you, buddy. They traded blows for a few more minutes, pummeling each other into oblivion, while Kale was certainly more skilled and had more tools at his disposal. Hugo possessed more raw power. Eventually, it came to a standstill. 
Kale had suffered upwards of 20 fatal injuries, forcing his regeneration ability to the brink. Hugo was bleeding all over, had about six bone fractures, an eye gouged out, and an ear ripped off. You're... pretty fucking annoying, aren't you? Kale rasped out. Hugo bent over, coughing up a mouthful of blood. Likewise. In the meantime, their confrontation had drawn an audience. Coming in from an intersecting corridor was Infernal Gladiator, six foot seven, two hundred and eighty-five pounds. He was high hurricane. Imagine an extremely buff zombie that was perpetually burning, clad in ancient gladiator gear. That was him. On one of his hands he gripped a gigantic flaming sword. In his other, he held two leashes, both holding respective voids at the neck, crawling at his feet like dogs straight from hell. One was the freak, six foot ten and two hundred and fifty three pounds, a slouching humanoid monster with strange flickering eyes and a grin that wrapped around its entire head. The other was the humanish centipede, a six foot four standing height and three hundred and seventy two pounds, a centipede like creature that had a vaguely human face covered in six eyes, with an iron muzzle obscuring the mouth area. It crawled on ten colossal, veiny arms. They were both mid-tornado tier, not incredibly powerful, they were merely simple, aggressive beasts that posed nothing but primal bloodlust and strength that was comparable to three wild bears put together. For that reason, they were easily converted into disposable weapons by the much stronger and more intelligent gladiator. Fucking hell, Kale said upon seeing the trio. That's fucking disgusting. Bloody abominations, Hugo added. Nothing but creatures that stain this earth. They both looked at each other and nodded. An explicit sense of mutual understanding between them. I suppose that a few of the voids teaming up should have been inevitable. Oh boy, I said, turning towards Sandu. He didn't respond at first instead looking as if he was trying to focus on something that wasn't the screen. What the hell's the matter? I asked him. I think there might be somebody else in here. Don't turn around, just keep watching. Pretend like you didn't hear it, he replied, hardly above a whisper. It's not like I had to pretend. Hear what? I thought to myself. Nevertheless, I'd never seen Sandy more serious. I turned my attention back to the monitors while forcing my ears to be alert. About ten seconds later, I heard it. It was soft, for sure. I wasn't surprised that I hadn't noticed it up until that point. Somewhere, in the darkness, behind us, somebody was definitely trying to contain a giggle to be continued. Just ignore it. It was a job easier said than done. And honestly, was it even a good idea? In my head, I ran through the list of potential voids that could have been lurking behind us. Of course, none of them were really ideal, especially not the rowdy clown whose laugh sounded hauntingly similar the one we were hearing behind us. And then we heard it again, louder this time. I muttered a barely audible fuck in response. Realistically, if it did turn out to be one of the voids, putting up some kind of resistance would have been pointless anyway. We were as good as done for. With that logic in mind, I turned my attention back to the monitors, hoping that whatever the hell was behind us would stay put for a bit longer. In the meantime, Hugo and Kale we're about to fight the gladiator and his minions. Hey, Englishman, Kale said. You regenerate quickly? Hugo sighed, stretching his neck out. First of all, don't call me that. It's rather crass, and no, not much faster than the average man. But no matter, God has ordained me a holy commission. He won't let me die until I fulfilled my duty. Kale just laughed. You're a real piece of work, British boy. Let's see if your god helps us make it out of this. You two aren't who I'm looking for, the gladiator bellowed before releasing both leashes. Take out the trash. The freak ran about six steps before having his face caved in and neck subsequently snapped by Hugo. In the meantime, the centipede began crawling towards Kale. 
Who the fuck created this thing? He said, shuddering slightly. The centipede lifted itself up, swiping two of its arms at the visibly disturbed vampire. Shit, don't touch me, he shouted, before kicking its face, removing its muzzle in the process. He regretted that decision instantly. The centipede had four or five rows of spike-like teeth, with a horde of flesh-covered tentacles swarming out of its mouth. One of them grabbed Kale by the leg, dragging him down. God damn it, he shouted, attempting to squirm out of the appendage's grasp. Nevertheless, Hugo came to the rescue, turning the centipede's head into mush with one vicious stomp. He shot Kale a cold gaze. Take his name in vain again, and our temporary alliance is over. Kale shot the tentacled remnants off of his legs, his face still utterly disgusted. Yeah, yeah, holy fucking shit, this is nasty. And then they both stared at the gladiator, who was grinning something malicious. Congratulations, you two have entered the privilege of being my combat slaves. I would literally rather fucking die, Kale shouted. I submit myself to God and God alone. Diseases like you shall perish at his will, Hugo added. The gladiator drew his smoldering sword, which must have been the size of a person. Then so be it, he roared. The two rushed him simultaneously, attempting to bury the burning menace with a flurry of quick strikes. But that wasn't the best idea. They couldn't even touch the gladiator without suffering from burns themselves. Kale sighed. Some asshole just had to dig this fuck up, didn't they? The gladiator stepped forward, unleashing a big swing that singed a few hairs off Hugo's head. Bastard, he shouted before sending a hard cross at the gladiator, shattering his chestplate armor in the process. You're pretty strong there, Brit. We just might win this one, Kale grinned. Like I said, God will give me enough strength to overcome these trials. Hugo moved towards the gladiator with a seemingly unwavering resolve, his eyes shining a bright crimson. His face was wrought with such intense stoic determination that I nearly forgot his ultimate goal was to commit a global genocide and began cheering him on. The gladiator sneered at the challenge, swinging his blade once again. This time Hugo deflected it with an elbow, cracking the metal while doing so. He followed up by directing a flying hook kick at the gladiator's jaw, managing to rip it off completely. Kale followed up by biting into the gladiator's shoulder and tearing a large chunk off, burning most of his face in the process. Ugh, he said, spitting the charred chunk of undead flesh. Not my cup of tea. Are you all right? Hugo asked, staring at his scorched face. Yeah, should heal up in no time. However, the gladiator was relentless, letting out a frenzied roar before bolting towards Kale. He managed to dodge most of the gladiator's blows, only taking the full brunt of his last punch. Still, that one blow was enough to form a deep, fleshy crater in his torso, while also sending him flying into the steel rail, causing it to bend. Fuck! Kale stammered out, staring down at the unsightly wound. Nope, that's not good. Gonna take longer to heal. Hugo exhaled. The situation has become... bothersome. He went back after the gladiator, sending a ruthless barrage of strikes his way. There was an evident skill gap between the two voids, with Hugo landing about 90% of his attacks. On the other hand, the gladiator only managed to land three or four clean hits of his own. Nonetheless, each one of them dealt far more damage than any of Hugo's. After about a minute of fighting, Hugo's left arm was completely mangled. His right rib cage had been shattered, and the entire right side of his face was burnt. The gladiator had also taken a fair amount of damage, but not nearly enough to even slow it down. Kale groaned as he attempted to insert himself back into the fight, but that task wasn't an easy one. He could hardly move with his torso just about completely destroyed. I suppose... This must be my final trial, Hugo said somewhat solemnly. The hell are you talking about? Kale asked, still groaning. And then, for the first time since we began watching, Hugo smiled. God wills it. Using his good arm, Hugo removed the upper section of his robe, revealing a pale, mutilated, scar-ridden body underneath. He muttered another prayer before looking up at the ceiling, tears now swelling up in his eyes. Thank you he muttered. Along with his eyes, the scars on his body suddenly began to glow a deep red. Tricks won't be enough, the gladiator thundered, before swinging his blade at Hugo's neck. I don't think I managed to catch exactly what happened next, however. I was certain that I was about to see a head rolling. Instead, the gladiator's blade shattered into what looked like a million pieces. At first, I didn't even notice the gaping hole in the gladiator's chest. 
How did you... The gladiator was interrupted by his neck being brutally cranked to the side as the flaming behemoth dropped. So did Hugo. By then, Kale had regenerated to the point of being able to walk. He stumbled over to the near comatose bishop. What the fuck was that? He asked, half grinning. I... detached myself from earthly limitations. An egregious sin, but... I needed to fulfill my holy mission. Well, shit. It's pretty cool, I guess. Not your psycho mission, but the whole detachment thing. He held out his hand in an attempt to help Hugo up. However, Hugo shook his head in response. This is as far as I go. Not something I can recover from. I only have judgment to face now. Oh, shut the fuck up. Kale said, picking up Hugo's limp body and lumbering it over his shoulder. We'll find you some painkillers. You'll be back to on your feet in no time. Why would you help me? Hugo asked. You will understand what I'm after, don't you? My ideals. Well, I don't think I could have handled the gladiator on my own, so I guess I owe you. Crazy fuck. He looked over at Hugo and grinned. And who knows? Maybe you'll learn something. Yeah, there's a lot of scum in the world. There's also a lot of beauty. Don't have to destroy it all. That's... Hugo passed out before he could finish his thought. Still carrying him over his shoulder, Kale took off running down another corridor. I did a quick sweep of the monitors. Satan Bot had taken out two more lower tier voids, while Morgi had engaged with a high hurricane void named the Mechanic. Six foot five, 270 pounds. Like the name suggested, he was a large, burly man in a mechanic outfit that enjoyed obliterating skulls with blunt tools. Real ruthless guy. On another monitor, the undead Nazi had just finished slicing the shit out of the devil nurse, who was a mid-tsunami. So that's 12 down, I thought. 20 left. The shit show wasn't anywhere near done. Hey, hey, check it out, Sandy said. There's still four voids who haven't escaped yet. Sure enough. He was right. First off, there was the Titan. Fifteen feet, seven inches, 1,438 pounds. A colossal entity with destructive capabilities that were nigh impossible to deal with. It was humanoid with a immensely muscular frame, further accentuated by the fact that there wasn't an ounce of fat on its entire body. Its harder-than-steel skin was reddish and cracked all over, with a roadmap of razor-like veins bulging out of every square inch. And then there was the face. It had six sets of glowing blue eyes, and a mouthful of fangs with exposed gums that were caustic to the touch. His holding cell, if you could even call it that, was a bit more fortified than the rest. I'm under-exaggerating, of course. It was fortified to goddamn hell. No electronic locks connected to a central system, either. It's probably what caused the breach to begin with. Good thing, too. He was a low asteroid. The next up was the Warden. 8 foot 7, 435 pounds. Ironically enough, the guy actually used to run a prison of his own. What kind of prison that might be was beyond me. He had pale white skin, shadow-like eyes, and long, slick-back silver hair. His trench coat was long and perpetually bloody, sweeping the floor as he walked. I've heard stories about the guy. Supposedly, he killed upwards of 700 prisoners during a breach at his prison, managing to come up unscathed from a devastating explosion afterward. He was as dangerous as a void could get without being considered asteroid tier, being a high earthquake. Funnily enough, his cell was wide open, guard bodies and destroyed mech suits littering the space, but instead of getting up and walking out, he simply sat, expression devoid of anything at all, like it usually was. Obviously... He was up to no good. Next one was quite the doozy. Strongest void in the entire chasm, in fact. He went by a simple moniker. The Calamity of Earth. Or the Calamity, for short. Its gender was unknown. Height and weight? Unknown. Appearance? Unknown to everybody except for the top official overseeing the entire fucking operation. Hell, we didn't even know where it was kept. Only thing we had to monitor was a simple panel containing three lights. Green, safe, still contained. 
Yellow, break out in progress. Evacuate immediately. And red, breached. But too fucking late. What do we know about this thing? Nothing, save for the fact that a breach would most likely result in a global catastrophe. Of course, it was a high asteroid. The only high asteroid, in fact. And then there was the last still captive void. But unlike the three overpowered monsters I've already talked about, he was a lot different. The kid, five foot six, 142 pounds. As his name implies, the kid was just that, a kid. From his appearance, he couldn't have been older than 16, 17 at most. Only thing we knew about him was that he apparently had extraordinary undisclosed abilities. Abilities he used to slaughter his entire village back in Kerala, India. But who the hell knows what actually happened? To me, and nearly every other guard, he just seemed like your average meek teenager. In fact, we rarely ever exercised caution around him. Unlike the rest of the voids in here, he just did as he was told, always with this incredibly sullen expression on his face. I suppose... can't blame him, given the circumstances. We didn't even bother putting a threat level on him. Nevertheless, we were instructed to keep him in there. There's a lot of stuff going on here in the chasm. Those guards don't quite understand. I make no reservations about that. I know for a goddamn fact that we're not doing any saintly work here. Do a lot of voids in here deserve to be locked up? Not even. They deserve to be wiped off the face of the earth. Never understood why we bothered holding the more malicious ones, using taxpayer money just to keep them alive. And then there were the ones I wasn't quite sure belonged here at all. Did they even do anything wrong? Who knows? One thing was for sure. They were different. Exceptional, I guess. The subjects of state curiosity. I always tried suppressing these thoughts. I mean, who the hell was I? Some random fucking guard, not some arbiter of morality. So, fuck it. It's not the time, so... Let's see. What happens next? I turned to face a random monitor, trying to take my mind off the kid. I caught what appeared to be the middle of a fight, with two combatants being Jack the Ripper, six foot one, 170 pounds, the infamous serial killer. Apparently, he performed some arcane ritual while on death's door that granted him an extended lifespan and superhuman strength in exchange for what was left of his already dwindling humanity. He hardly resembled a man when we caught him. Mouth full of sharp, rotting teeth, eyes sunken beyond reason, and a face riddled with cuts, burns, and various infections. He was quite the sore sight to behold. At that moment, he was once again on death's door. The person who put him there? Bella Vauklin, also known as the Bloody Painter. Five foot five, 122 pounds. Despite looking more like a normal woman, she was a brutal assassin that wasn't too concerned with the aftermaths of her jobs. After killing her target, she painted a bloody picture on the walls. Sometimes she'd supplement her art with a few organs. She wasn't incredibly strong, but that didn't matter all that much. She had the obscure ability where she could summon blades out of thin air at the tip of her fingers, and then use some Esper-like ability to shoot them off in rapid succession, almost at a machine gun-like rate of fire. She had no problem reducing her targets to mincemeat, the ones she really disliked, that is. When we finally captured her, she maintained that she only killed the ones that really deserved it. However, any chance of appeal, not that there was a chance to begin with, was shattered when she punctured the throats of four guards. She still claims that it was an accident to this day. Do I believe her? Well, it's about 50-50 with me. Like I said, she had Jack on the ropes with what must have been over a hundred blades planted firmly within the killer's body, including both of his eyes. Still, he'd yet to give up as he swung Wirehead's bat, must have picked it up, blindly and wildly around him. Bella wasn't unscathed herself, though, it looked as if she'd taken a couple of pretty bad hits to her ribs and thigh. In addition to that, she had a gnarly bite mark on her hand. Nevertheless, she smiled, pointed a finger like a pistol at the frenzied Jack. Profiteer de l'enfer, she said, before blasting the killer to shreds finally ending his grim legacy. Once she was done with that, she let out a loud sigh, clutching her ribs and wincing in pain. Unlike most of the other voids, 
she wasn't capable of taking too much punishment. After walking for a bit, she came across Luz. While still badly mangled from his confrontation with Wirehead, he was walking again. The two stared at each other for about a minute, where Bella stuck out her hand and smiled. It was a risk, for sure. But while Luz didn't reciprocate the smile, they cooperated, accepting the handshake without electrocuting her. Another team-up, and one I wouldn't necessarily have expected. I did another quick sweep of the monitors. Morgie had taken out the mechanic, although he was limping now, and his next fight wasn't going to be an easy one. He was a few steps from coming across Satanbot. In the meantime, and funnily enough, the undead Nazi was about to square off with the sadistic Soviet. Six foot two, 215 pounds, low earthquake tier. Instead of being zombified like the Nazi, he was more mechanical. More specifically, he was about 60% robot, with his human bits slowly beginning to rot away. The surgeon was engaged in a bloody duel with Spider-Man, 6'9", 225 pounds. Unlike Peter Parker, this guy was basically just a large tarantula with human skin and a half-human head. Kale and Hugo were in the medical center, with the former tending to the latter's wounds. I thought about everything for a second, trying to run the numbers through my head. There were four more voids who had definitely escaped that I hadn't yet seen on any of the monitors, but I was really only concerned about two of them. You see, within the chasm, there are four asteroid tier voids in total. Only two of them were still contained. The problem was rather obvious. Beyond that, there were now 14 voids dead, four who still hadn't joined the fight. 14 clearly active, all four asteroids still in play. Three high earthquakes as well. TFVNH likely on their way. Holy fuck, I thought to myself. The real fight hasn't even started yet. A bout of sudden, racketous laughter nearly gave me a heart attack. I look at Sandu, but his face was dead serious. That meant... Shit. With everything that was going on, I completely forgot about the elephant in the room. But sure enough, they were finally ready to reveal themselves. As footsteps began emanating from the darkness behind us, I braced myself for whatever horrific entity we were surely about to encounter. But instead of that, it was an unfamiliar guy that looked to be in his mid-twenties with messy, dirty blonde hair, dressed in a Hawaiian shirt and khaki shorts. Probably around 5'10", 130 pounds, soaking wet. What? The hell? Sandu sat upon seeing him. The man continued laughing as he strolled towards us. Oh, man! He blurted out in between chuckles. There's shit in both your pants right now, isn't there? Don't lie to me. Well, joke's gone on long enough. Who the fuck are you? Sandu asked, sounding somewhat agitated. The man put his arms up in an ostensibly defensive manner. Relax. I'm just an observer here, but... His bloodshot eyes seemed to bulge out as they wandered over the monitors. Looks like the preliminaries are over. Time for the good shit. To be continued. I'm so sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. The man stepped towards us with a gaze that I can only describe as volatile. Perhaps in the moment he had no ill intent, but there were volcanoes behind his eyes, volcanoes that looked ready to erupt at any damn point. For that reason, I found myself slowly backing away. Not Sandu. For whatever reason, he stood his ground facing the strange man without reservations. I suppose it also helped that he was six foot four, with a considerably larger frame. The name's Adrian Nyquist, he said, his voice nearly shaking with some kind of obscure excitement. He held out his hand, but neither of us bothered with the niceties of the introduction. He sighed. What? Is it me? He lifted his shirt collar, taking a whiff. Whew, you got a shower more, Adrian. Then he started laughing again. But can you blame me? I've been busy. What the? Who the fuck are you? Sandu insisted. And don't just tell us your name again. Okay, Adrian said, smirking. Big guy, scary stuff, really. Would you bench? Three plates and a bit? 
Sandu opened his mouth again, but was interrupted. It's fine, though. I'll go ahead and explain myself. I mean, the whole situation is kind of weird. Yep, I responded. Just kind of. Adrian sat down on the floor and let out a big puff of air. <laughs> I don't really want to go in too in-depth here. I don't enjoy talking about myself, so let me just drop the bomb on you first. I caused the breach. I nearly swallowed my tongue. What the fuck do you mean? I meant what I said. <laughs> I let all the prisoners out. But what? How? I stammered out. He tilted his head back and groaned before pretending to type on an invisible keyboard. Just a little hacking, man. No, nothing crazy. And they say that you'll never use the skills you learn in school in real life. <sighs> hacking. I responded in disbelief. But why? Well, that's where it does get a little crazy. Now, have you ever hopped dimensions? Have I... Have I ever fucking what? All right, I see you're uninitiated with the concept. Well, unlike hacking some corny lock system, the logistics there really do get complicated. I'll admit I don't 100% understand it myself, but I understand it just enough to have some fun. I was at a complete loss. I'm a jumper, that's what they call us. He chuckled somewhat goofily. <laughs> Still a novice, but at least I'm out there doing it. Living life, you know, anyway. The multiverse is massive, obviously. A lot of crazy worlds out there just waiting to be explored, but he paused. I made a mistake last month. You see, I was watching some brutal big stakes fight a tournament called the Evisceration Championships on a planet called the Hellscape. <laughs> Real fucked up place, but drugs laws are mostly unenforced there, so you know. It's all right, I guess. <laughs> anyway, I'm up in the stands, 12th row, just blitzed out of my fucking mind like Astro Coke. It's like regular Coke, if you, if regular Coke was actually good. <laughs> he blew his nose into a disgusting handkerchief. But sometimes you make some bad decisions when you're a juiced. I guess school taught us something else, huh? Long story short, I made a deal with some fucking sketchy intergalactic gang leader named Bones the Fourth that I'd provide him a fighter that would guarantee him a win for the next tournament. But obviously, I was just talking shit. <laughs> Not sure why the guy believed me. An Astro Cokehead of all people. He burst out laughing again. <laughs> I'd never understand the rich. Okay. I responded, barely comprehending what I'd just been told. Assuming that what you just said is all true and that you're not completely fucking bonkers. Why don't you just tell the guy that you don't have a fighter? Well, Adrian made a whoopsie gesture with his hands. The guy paid up front a metric fuck ton of intergalactic currency and about 22 kilograms of Astro Coke. Then just give it back to him. All right, Mr. Self-Control. Teach me your fucking secrets. Look, I've blown all the money. I still have a few kilograms of coke, though, for a uh, rainy day. I'm not sharing it, by the way. So, what the hell? This whole thing's some fucked up tournament to you? You're just gonna drag the last void standing to fight in these evisceration matches? Well, it's a little uh, less of a tournament, more of a haphazard free-for-all. <laughs> I'm no logistics expert, after all. I didn't know what the hell I was supposed to say to the guy. If you're behind this breach, then you're responsible for the deaths of hundreds of guards, hundreds of good men. Sandu coughed. Most of them good men. Adrian rolled his eyes. Yeah, okay, real loss, huh? <laughs> I'm just trying to live my life here, man. You're insane. Look, did that comment get us anywhere? You feel better now after stating the obvious? No reply from Sandu. Adrian sighed. Look, we could just enjoy the show now, hmm? What's done is done. He was interrupted by Sandu trying to tackle him to the ground. The man did know his jujitsu, but no luck. Couldn't even get Adrian to budge. I saw the veins in his forehead bulge as he apparently exerted all the strength trying to subdue the strange, lanky man. Shit, he said through gritted teeth. This guy's strong. Adrian simply pulled out a pack of cigarettes, looking completely unbothered. You know, I've taken a lot of strange drugs from a lot of different dimensions. One of them was bound to be a steroid. Also, he began grinning like a maniac, I'm no stranger to training. 
wouldn't survive out there if I was weak like you guys. He picked Sandu up by the collar and gently tossed him back. Given the circumstances, I'll forget you just tried attacking me. Now, why don't we sit tight and watch? I held up a hand. One last question, if you will. Adrian rolled his eyes and groaned like a child. Oh, come on! We're missing the good shit! But fine, hurry up. The last void standing. They're bound to be pretty strong, right? Adrian nodded. Stronger than you? Well, no shit. I'll try to grab some jump. Okay, so how the hell are you going to convince them to come with you? These prisoners aren't exactly reasonable. Adrian stared at me with just about the stupidest look on his face for about ten seconds. Well... You know what they say. He cracked his knuckles. You just gotta live in the now. You're an idiot. Would an idiot get this far? The idiot had a point. If he really was the mastermind behind the breach, the guy had some wicked skills. But at the same time, his common sense was close to non-existent. Whatever, I'll figure it out when the time comes, he said. In the meantime, he shot us both a rather menacing glance. Let's enjoy the damn show! I locked eyes briefly with Sandu. I understood why he was angry. I was too. However, the situation was really beyond helping. We could only do as we were told. While we'd been talking, the Nazi had defeated the Soviet. Although he did suffer gruesome injuries from the bout, a portion of his gas mask had been shattered, revealing a rotting jaw underneath. In fact, his entire body had been pummeled to a near pulp as he struggled to limp along the rails. Adrian grunted. <laughs> Great, we missed the World War II rematch. I hope you guys are happy with yourselves. The guy really was like a child. A really capable, psychotic child. In other news, Satanbot had blown up Morgi, along with an entire corridor, while the surgeon had made a surprise discovery after disemboweling the spider's abdomen. It was filled with about 200 smaller humanoid spiders that began swarming him. It was hard not to shudder at the sight. Bella and Luz looked like they were still trying to find a way out, while Kale and Hugo encountered the rowdy clown. Six foot seven, 177 pounds. Rowdy really was something else. His appearance didn't just make you fear clowns and the carnival. He made you fear life itself. An impossibly tall, skinny, and pale ghoul-like humanoid dressed in a bloody, dirty 1960s clown costume with twitching twig-like fingers and cracked red lips enveloping a mouth filled with sharp, sticky black teeth. And then there was the fact that he had no eyes and two thin, bleeding slits for a nose. I really do wonder what kind of god could have created such an entity. But he wasn't terribly strong, only being a mid-tsunami. Rowdy spat a mouthful of dark, gooey spit at Kale, dissolving the right side of his face. Ugh! Kale muttered, trying to wipe the ungodly substance away, only to pull apart part of his flesh and muscle in the process. Just nuke this fucking place! Rowdy began cackling like a hellish fiend that he was, swinging a lead balloon attached to a barbed wire right at still injured Hugo's head. However, Kale managed to intercept it at the last moment, breaking his own hand in the process. Suddenly, a pair of giant bat-like wings sprouted from his back. He flew towards Rowdy before drop-kicking his head clean off. That seemed like something you should have used earlier, Hugo remarked nonchalantly. You know I would. Doing so makes me feel pretty gross. I decided to check back on the surgeon. But he was gone. Oh, fuck, I muttered as I began seeing the black haze around me. I felt a cold hand on my shoulder, followed by a high-pitched, slimy voice that oozed its way into my ears. You got me out of a real sticky situation there. Hesitantly, I looked up at the surgeon's cold, dark gaze as he grinned like a maniac down at me, and then his neck was twisted a full 360 degrees. As he dropped, Adrian let out a big breath of air, stretching out his knuckles. A uh, guy broke the rules. No running from a fight. Besides, he was weak. We're gonna stood a chance in the evisceration matches anyway. Is he... dead? I stammered out, looking down at the limp surgeon. Uh, yeah. Adrian responded. I shook my head in disbelief. But we, we've put sniper bullets through his temples. How did you... Adrian shot me a smug grin. Like I said, y'all are just weak. <laughs> now keep watching. Things are getting interesting. 
A few moments later, the Nazi came across the remnants of the spider and its hatchlings, torching them to ashes without hesitation, allowing me to breathe easier. Immediately after taking out the spider, he crossed paths with the Chattering Man, 5'11", 145 pounds, mid-earthquake tier. As much as I hated sympathizing with Nazis, the guy couldn't seem to catch a break. Resembling a horribly slouched humanoid, the Chattering Man was the kind of creature that parents told their kids about in an attempt to scare them into being good. Each and every one of his limbs were jagged and contorted, covered by thin, borderline translucent skin that was still inexplicably bulletproof. His eyes were covered in a damp, bloody, and dirty cloth, while his long, black, matted hair swayed wildly as he twitched around. And then, there were his teeth. They were giant, about twice the size of a normal human's, and coinciding with his name, rapidly and constantly chattering like hell, yielding one of the most disturbing sounds imaginable. Adrian slammed his fist on the table in excitement. Yes! This is a matchup I've been waiting to see! The chattering man stared the Nazi down, his teeth rattling together like a frenzied demonic drum. The Nazi responded by abruptly engulfing him in a sea of flames. However, the chattering man simply walked through it completely unscathed. I could see the Nazi clench his jaw in apparent frustration. He drew his knife and rushed in, attempting to engage him up close. The chatterer was surprisingly fast, dodging each slash before biting down on the Nazi's flamethrower tank. The subsequent explosion flung them both into the air, destroying a good portion of the Nazi's back in the process. On the other hand, the chattering man only suffered a few cracked teeth. Holy hell, I muttered. Truth be told, I'd never actually seen the chattering man in action up until that point. Perhaps we'd been lowballing him on the threat scale. The Nazi let out a hoarse scream before rushing back towards his disturbing opponent. He managed to sink his blade into the chattering man's shoulder before being blindsided by a swipe to the face, completely shattering what remained of his mask, revealing his full, zombified visage underneath. The chattering man surged his head forward, biting a large chunk out of the Nazi's face, causing spurts of dark green blood to explode everywhere. He followed it up with ripping his arm off before savagely beating the undead soldier with his own appendage. The Nazi attempted one last stand, grabbing the knife that was still lodged inside the chattering man's shoulder, carving a large gash that extended down to his ribcage. Nevertheless, his admittedly impressive run was finally over. Not seeming to acknowledge the wound at all, the chattering man plunged two bony fists into the Nazi's chest before ripping his torso in half. Quite the gruesome display for sure, but Adrian seemed to revel in it. He let out a racketous cheer for the victor. What the fuck is wrong with this guy? I thought to myself. Tossing that thought aside, it became apparent that things were beginning to come down to the wire. Kale and Hugo had found themselves within the vicinity of the dancing guy, five foot seven, 155 pounds, he was an ordinary-looking, albeit racially ambiguous man in his mid-twenties, with short, light brown hair in perpetual five o'clock shadow, dressed in a plain white t-shirt and track pants. He always wore a pair of unbranded earbuds connected to an MP3 that never seemed to run out of battery. And of course, he never stopped dancing. He was a mid-asteroid, the third strongest being within the entire chasm. Hell, it's entirely possible that he actually is the strongest. We've never seen him fight against the top two, after all. So just how the hell was such an ostensibly innocuous man so dangerous? Who the hell knew? Like most of the prisoners, he was truly beyond explanation. If I had to classify him, he'd 100% be chaotic neutral. He had no concept of good or evil, no sense of right or wrong, no goals, no ideals. The guy just wanted to dance. He sure as hell was a menace while doing so. Yet he'd never go out of his way to bother you, you just had to stay out of his. He could disintegrate people just by touching them. He'd simply dance through your body, leaving nothing but shreds of flesh and blood behind. And if you ever tried stopping him, oh boy. See, his eyes were always closed when he was dancing to the music funneling into his ears. If that music ever stopped, then he'd be forced to open them up. And then, all hell would break loose. He'd go on a rampage until he got those earbuds back, and nothing could take him down in the process. Nothing. 
For that reason, it was better to leave him undisturbed, allowing him to dance to his heart's content. For that reason, his holding cell was the largest, giving him plenty of room to do so. Fun fact, he listens to many genres, but his favorite is EDM, specifically melodic trance and hardstyle. But now he was out. Bad news for everyone. And Kale knew it. Shit, he muttered. We're not dealing with that. Why? Hugo asked. Is he strong? Kale nodded. More than you know. Then that's all the more reason why we need to eliminate him, Hugo said, attempting to crawl towards the dancer. But before he could make the biggest mistake of his life, Kale scooped him up and began running the other direction. Let's not do that. Yeah, the big boys are coming out. Adrian's abrupt shout nearly shattered my eardrums. I glanced over to see which monitor he was looking at, and then... Then I understood his excitement. Satanbot had come across the next opponent, but it wasn't one that he was going to have such an easy time with. Standing opposite of him on a walkway on the very top floor was Long Wu, also known as the Mechanical Menace. Six foot nine, 375 pounds. He was mid-asteroid right in between the Calamity and the Dancing Guy in terms of estimated strength. He was actually a special case. You see, he was originally held in the Chinese equivalent of the Chasm, known as the Well. However, as a political favor, a complicated exchange, mind you, the U.S. allowed the PRC to transfer Wu over. This was shortly after he'd killed 400-plus guards and nearly escaped entirely. They just really didn't want to deal with him anymore. He's also interesting in the sense that he wasn't born with any supernatural abilities or superhuman prowess. His danger comes from his brilliant but unhinged mind and his obsession with being the concept of transhumanism and being, quote, the change that shifts humanity into a new technological age, end quote. His original progress-driven ideals could have been deemed noble at some point. But then he went off the deep end with power and decided to prove just how much better we could be once we'd fully integrated ourselves with technology. And how did he decide to do this? By trying to kill anybody and everybody that he saw. His power came from his suit, which he'd apparently semi-fused with his own body. It was comprised of a dark, unidentifiable metal that had so far proven to be unbreakable. With it, he had a vast arsenal of devastatingly overpowered weapons at his disposal. Machine guns, shotguns, explosives, knives, you name it. Both of the eyes on his helmet were also capable of firing railgun blasts. But his most powerful weapon was something he called the Singularity Blade. That weapon was where the science ended and the fucked up shit began. Being about five feet long and glowing a deep ember, this sword was an enigma. I'm not sure how he made it or what he did to attain it, but it sure as hell wasn't the result of any kind of engineering. Any time that he swung it, a sharp, ear-splitting roar could be heard from everywhere and nowhere at once, and then from the tip of the blade, some kind of ghost-like, serpent-esque entity would emerge, utterly annihilating everything in the area with its flames, fangs, and claws. You could only see it for about a second, and most guards were under the impression that it didn't even exist. But it does. And it's haunting. They're going to destroy this place, Sandu said. Adrian pulled an old-looking pack of peanuts out of his back pocket, stuffing a handful into his mouth. <laughs> you got that right, he shouted, spitting crumbs everywhere. Wu took the first offensive, unleashing a typhoon of bullets from a chain gun that jutted out from his chest. Satanbot managed to dodge every shot, closing the distance between them in the process. Both of their movements were incredibly hard to follow, of course. Once he got close, he attempted to strike Wu with his tail, only to find it blocked by a large shield that abruptly materialized from his forearm. Wu attempted to slice the tail off with a large axe, but Satanbot managed to evade the blow, at least at the last second. I suddenly understood why he was so dangerous. Unlike Satanbot, whose weapons were already fixed on its body, Wu's suit was capable of adapting to any situation, morphing its robotic appendages into whatever weapon was best suited to counter its opponent. Jesus Christ, I muttered at the realization. This guy's a fucking monster. Even though Satanbot had managed to dodge that strike, the next one would prove more difficult to evade. In a borderline flash-like movement, Wu threw a Muay Thai kick at Satanbot's side, piercing it with a spike that protruded from the tip of his foot. 
He finished the combo by transforming his fist into a tool comparable in appearance to a meat grinder, drilling it into Satanbot's shoulder and tearing an arm off in the process. Adrian groaned, and I thought the devil robot was going to put up more of a fight. But he spoke too soon. After taking the hit, Satanbot was already on the counter, whipping its tail around to strike the side of Wu's head. Wu recoiled slightly, still managing to destroy one of Satanbot's knees with a railgun blast at his stagger. He was about to finish the job when a large cannon materialized from Satanbot's torso, a hidden last stand weapon, I suppose. From the barrel, it fired out an immense blast of purple energy that Wu barely had time to dodge as it scorched the side of his helmet. It blew a gigantic fucking hole in the fortified ceiling, causing sunlight to leak in. Keep in mind, we're almost a hundred feet underground. But Wu didn't give Satan Bot any more time to reveal any further tricks, blasting its body to bits with a brutal spray from automatic grenade launchers. It seemed as if Adrian was about to pass out from the excitement. That's my boy! He shouted. Fuck bones! We're gonna win this whole tournament ourselves! What I hadn't noticed was Bella and Luz watching the whole encounter from behind cover. Bella's eyes lit up upon seeing the whole, or rather convenient, escape route. She ran out from her hiding spot before leaping an extraordinary distance into the air, right towards freedom. But then, out of nowhere, a massive armored hand grabbed her by the neck. From the surface, a gigantic man dressed in a streamlined mech suit of a model that I hadn't been familiar with dropped down, landing hard on the walkway. He continued to nonchalantly strangle Bella as he surveyed the scene. What a mess. His booming voice reverberated through the monitors. It's time to enforce justice. If Adrian was giddy before, he was off the rails now. They're here! They're finally here! It's time for the semi-fucking finals! Who the hell is here? I asked, already somewhat knowing the answer. The Alpha Boys and Girls, the Apex Predators, he responded. Task Force, Void, Nova, Hammer. Task Force, Void, Nova, Hammer. Most of the guards I knew were just dying to see them in action. I was the odd one out in that regard. Um, they were here now, and those guards were too dead to see him. Sorry, that really was a distasteful joke. I guess Adrian's presence has rubbed off on me just a tiny bit. Speaking of Adrian, he was feverishly fumbling around in his pockets while keeping his eyes glued on the monitor. After a few moments, he tossed a bag of white powder onto the table. Astro Coke? I asked. He shook his head. Nah, just the regular stuff. The show's not at its climax yet. Gotta pace myself. He snorted the whole mound in about half a minute. Yo! He grunted, wiping his nose off. You fellas want to hear a secret? I don't think we had a choice. Task Force. Void Nova. Whatever. How do you think the members get recruited? I shrugged. Dunno. Some kind of test, I guess. He guffawed. Nah! They're voids as well! My mouth dropped. As he went on to explain, the TFVNH was a constantly rotating team comprised of voids, save for a few exceptions, who were a reasonable balance of both powerful and sane. In fact, different countries occasionally lent their own voids to one another to use for their respective forces. In exchange for their services, the members would be allowed to live freely among society, although they were monitored heavily while doing so. You sure know a lot of confidential stuff. Sandu said to Adrian. Just who the hell are you? Adrian sat back in his seat. Ah, uh, nobody. Just a dabbler. A jack of all trades. Master of a good handful. <laughs> he sure was insufferable. In any case, I put my sights back on the monitors. As Bella struggled against the seemingly unsurmountable foe, she tried blasting him with a blade spray. But before she could even raise her hand, it was broken with a single firm grasp. She spat, the life draining from her breath with every word. As Adrian would go on to tell us, this particular TFVNH member was... Kente, the guillotine Sanders. Six foot six and 287 pounds. Supposedly, he was a real hard ass. An abnormally powerful man with an incredibly skewed and strict sense of justice. To him, the word nuance meant nothing. 
Rehabilitation was a joke. Second chances were an alien concept. He was a man whose worldview was utterly black and white. To him, the laws that landed him in prison didn't constitute legitimate justice. His ideals were the only ones that mattered. Cross his sensibilities and you were a criminal in desperate need of execution. He's got a pretty notorious reputation in these parts, Adrian continued. He's captured at least seven of the voids in here himself. Nearly killed all of them as well. Honestly, I'm not rooting for him to win. It's gonna be too hard to wrangle in afterwards. Just as Bella looked about ready to pass out, Kente was blindsided by a sudden rush from Luz. Well, I guess blindsided wasn't really the right term. Kente blocked his strike with relative ease. There's revenge customer numero uno, Adrian said. The big guy wiped out Luz's entire village before dragging him into this place. No wonder he's pissed. For the first time, Luz had a fierce expression on his face. He let out a rage-laden shriek before digging both of his hands into the only exposed part of Kente's body, his neck, lightening up the area and his face with sparks. Oh boy, that ain't gonna work, Adrian muttered, grinning. Kente grunted, seemingly taking the full brunt of the excessive shock without going down, before grabbing both of Luz's arms and slamming him onto the floor. He dropped Bella in the process, who immediately ran off with her life. Adrian clicked his tongue in disdain. It's not even gonna help him. I guess that's women for you. Sandu and I kind of just glanced at each other awkwardly following the comment. Unfortunately, Luz's rage just wasn't enough for him to fulfill his revenge. While still on the ground, Kente stomped on his head, crushing it like a watermelon. Quite the gruesome sight to behold. Afterwards, he set aside on Wu. We'd been observing the whole exchange. Finally, Adrian said. The strong are going at it. For a moment, Wu and Kente both seemed to acknowledge each other's power, hesitating for just a moment, and then, in a flash, they rushed each other simultaneously. Both of their opening moves were kicks, catching each other's respective legs midair, causing the walkway beneath them to crack underneath their combined pressure. On top of possessing overwhelming strength, they were both apparently skilled in martial arts as well. A terrifying combination, but Wu possessed another, more devastating aspect on top of all of it. Actual weapons. Wu dropped his leg, opting to blast Kente with a flurry of shotgun rounds instead. It was enough to send him flying backwards, breaking apart the torso section of his suit. And he didn't give him a second to breathe. Wu rushed forward immediately after, grabbing Kente's helmet and slamming it down on his knee, shattering it completely. He attempted to decapitate him on the spot with a saw, but Kente caught the slash before it could land. He looked up at Wu, his dark eyes twisted with rage. He broke the saw in half before delivering a powerful-looking right cross to Wu's stomach that splintered a portion of his suit and sent him crashing into the rails. He managed to crack the damned thing, I thought, astonished at the fact. That meant, at a minimum, Kente's punches packed more stopping power than a M203 grenade. Ooh, he's getting serious, Adrian smiled. You know what they call his striking technique? What? The pulverizing fist. He twists his knuckles at the last moment, grinding the flesh to a pulp. With his strength, it's like drilling through wet toilet paper. But that's only for regular people. <laughs> Doesn't work on big boys like Woo. The armor covering Kente's knuckles was shattered upon the impact. He winced in pain as he cocked it back, preparing to deliver another strike. You're an impediment to justice, he said through gritted teeth. Prepare to be executed. But before the two could clash again, five more figures jumped down from the hole that Satanbot had created, landing in succession around Kente. Looks like the whole gang's arrived, Adrian said. He began giving us a rundown of the other TFVNH members. First off, there was Ken, the fugitive, Rio. Six foot two, 165 pounds. A Korean American from Brooklyn. Not a super malicious guy. He kind of just did whatever the hell he wanted. Problem is, a lot of those things happen to be illegal and unethical, let's be honest. He was nonchalantly chewing tobacco as he leaned on the rails. His ability was rather interesting. Even Adrian had a hard time explaining it. Physically speaking, Ken was more or less average. However, he had the ability to summon portals from which obscure-looking but terribly powerful entities would emerge and tear apart his opponents. But at the end of the day, all that he really wanted to do was escape. He hated being monitored. Next, there was Nassar, the Bloody Twister. Five foot nine, 168 pounds. He was alone from the Saudi Arabian government. 
He possessed the ability to transform into a whirlwind comprised of glass-like material, moving at speeds upwards of 120 miles per hour, along with being able to blast out deadly streams of shards at multiple targets at once. It's quite the gruesome way to go out. He was also a really weird guy, and while nearly every other void assigned to TFVNH had relatively clear ambitions, his were an absolute mystery. He probably wasn't up to anything good. His eyes were darting wildly around while a gigantic, mischievous-looking grin was plastered across his face. Next up, there was Kalista, the beautiful demon Taylor, 5'11 and 121 pounds. She was a former fashion model based in Australia. Her career ended at the ripe age of 23, when she ended up suddenly murdering four of her fellow models, along with the police force sent to detain her. Supposedly, her abilities had been latent from her birth, gradually building up to a point where she was unable to keep it any longer. In her demon mode, her mouth would fall abnormally agape. Dark rings would form around her pupils and her body. Her body would be engulfed in gray, cold flames. At that point, she'd become intangible like a ghost and drift into her victims' bodies, causing them to bleed profusely from every orifice. But that only worked on humans. For most voids, she'd have to resort to physical brawling using her razor-like fingers. Her ambitions were fairly explicit. She just wanted to kill everybody, void or not. It begged the question as to why they'd even assigned her to a task force to begin with, given the fact that she was so damn volatile. Whatever. I never understand these people. She was staring intently at Nassar, but without any real emotion behind her gaze. Kind of just looked like she wanted to kill him for the sake of it. Continuing on, there was Clint, the normal guy Rockwell. Six foot one, 180 pounds. Like Nassar, he was also a mystery. Supposedly, he'd never been a void at all. No otherworldly powers or abilities, just a regular, albeit capable guy. Adrian didn't know much about him, only that he was a special case. Granted access to confidential information and a spot on the TFVNH due to a recommendation from an unnamed higher up. In order to compensate for his lack of physical ability, he was granted an oversized power suit dubbed the Behemoth, along with the God Slaying Cannon, a heavy duty automatic rifle that fired explosive rounds at 600 RPM. He stood still with a rather determined expression on his face, as if he had his mind set on a singular, concrete objective. Rounding out the bunch was the de facto leader of the force, Jack the All-American Barnes, six foot zero and 200 pounds. Like Clint, he wasn't a void either. Born in Oklahoma and belonging to a prolific family, he was an inexhaustibly skilled soldier turned government agent who managed to work his way up to the top with the help of some nepotism. Eventually, he was chosen as the inaugural subject of a project dubbed the Paragon Trials in which government scientists would attempt to genetically engineer superhumans. Well, he wasn't actually the first, but that's what he was told. Peace of mind. In any case, his trials ended up working out in the end. I guess the eighth time really was the charm. As a result, he was basically Superman, save for the flight. Genetic engineering hadn't advanced that far yet. Man, look at those blonde curls, Adrian commented. How the fuck does he get his hair like that? He had an arrogant grin on his face as he strolled to the front of the pack. It only took me five seconds of looking at him to reach the conclusion that he was probably a giant asshole. What's the rush, Kente? Let's not get too excited here, Jack said. Remember who's giving the orders, yeah? Your arbitrary orders mean nothing to me. Kente responded, still staring at Wu. The only thing that matters is justice. I could see a large vein bulge out on Jack's forehead from the opposition. Okay, he muttered before seemingly composing himself. Let's finish the task at hand. He directed his gaze towards Wu. Come on, big guy. You lost your chance at a fair fight when you decided to become a robot psycho. While Wu may have been a match for Kente by himself, taking the entirety of the TFVNH at once was a rather tall order. I guess he knew this himself as he jumped over the rails, landing on the lower floor. I'm going after him. Jack said, stepping forward. The rest of you, take out the riffraff. They want the voids alive, but I'm going to be sorely disappointed if you don't bring me back some fucking minced meat. That was one thing him and Kente could agree on. And remember, he said, turning back, his expression suddenly teeming with fury. You're all scumfuck piece of shit voids as well. You try to escape? Try to fuck with me? 
and you're going to be begging me to end your pathetic fucking lives. He pointed at Ken. You stay here. Make sure nobody tries to escape through the roof. Instead of acknowledging the order, Ken just spat his tobacco into a plastic bottle. Hey, you listening to me? Remember when we beat you in the fucking war? Isn't he Korean? Clint muttered. Ken just raised an eyebrow at the remark. Dude, I don't even know how to respond to that. Look, whatever. Just fucking listen to me, all right? Jack screamed. Ken grinned sarcastically and made a defensive gesture. Okay, boss. Jack's forehead vein bulged out even more. He was really starting to look pretty gross. All right. Let's fucking go, then. After finishing his motivational speech, he jumped down, presumably going after Wu. Save for Ken, the rest of the TFVNH followed suit, scattering throughout the chasm in search of the remaining voids. Strong were finally about to converge in one bloody path. As dark, weird, and gruesome as the whole situation was, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't at least a little bit excited to see what was about to transpire. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to tell you about one quick thing. A new book available from tonight's author, T.W. Grimm, Mrs. Blackmore. It's available now on Amazon. You can find more in the link in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. Whenever the question, what's the worst job you ever had, comes up in conversation, I usually just make something up on the spot, but I honestly don't really know how to answer. You see, the worst job I've ever had also happens to be the very best job. I know it's a bit of a contradiction, but allow me to tell my story from the beginning, and maybe, maybe, it'll make a little more sense by the time that I'm done. When it comes to job hunting, I, I wasn't in a position to have a more specific employment preference beyond someone who will hire me and reliably hand me a paycheck every week, so I hardly even paid attention to what kind of business I was applying to. I just slink up to the reception counter and forced my resume into the hands of whoever was foolish enough to make eye contact. Not an exact science, by any means, but it usually worked. Someone would eventually give me a job and life could continue on as usual. So there I was. In June of 1996. 24 years old and freshly laid off from a shitty temp job at an equally shitty factory. Once again, I found myself pounding the pavement with a file folder of resumes clutching beneath my arm. I handed out over a hundred of them and received exactly two phone calls from prospective employers. One of the offers was an obvious pyramid scheme involving steak knives and the other... The other offer was downright bizarre. It was for a position as an assistant caretaker at a zoo. Now, it, it's true that I had a tendency to zone out when I was trudging around the city with my resume in hand, but I, I definitely would have remembered applying for a job at a zoo. In fact, I was pretty sure our city didn't even have a zoo. The gruff-sounding guy on the other end of the line got straight to the point. He cleared his throat and rumbled, Hey, kid, how you doing? So, you applied for a job over at my dealership, and uh, am I right? I don't need no help over there right now, but I could really use an extra hand at the zoo. You got a vehicle, kid? This place is way out of the outskirts of town. I told him I did indeed own a car, the rusty old 83 LeSabre that was patiently waiting to die and go to Buick Heaven. He said, well, I checked some things out, and long story short, job's as good as yours if you want it. I was only 24, but that was plenty old enough to know something's fishy if an employer hires you over the phone without so much as a brief interview. Even so, I agreed to come out there and give it a shot, because I simply had to see what the hell this guy was on about. I mean, why could I resist? He told me to show up around 8 o'clock in the morning. Ring the buzzer at the gate, he instructed me and ask for Vic Bonicelli, you know, like the commercial on the radio. Come on down to Bonicelli Motors, we'll give you a steal over deal, and put you behind the wheel. Yeah, that's me. I said, oh, I'm going to work for a celebrity. We shared a polite laugh. I told him I didn't have any experience working at a zoo, but Vic assured me that it wouldn't matter. 
I'd be following basic instructions from the expert, who would always be nearby when we were working with the animals. Don't worry, you're gonna love it. Everyone loves the zoo, am I right? In the background, I heard a man yell, Hey, Victor! Truck's still waiting at the gate! The guy is starting to get mad! Vic yelled back, He just drove for 18 hours! Five more minutes ain't gonna kill him! He returned his attention to me and groaned, Christ, it never stops around here. I gotta go, kid. I'll see you tomorrow. The line went dead. I looked at my phone with a raised eyebrow and a weird feeling tingling in my guts. I wasn't sure what had just happened, but I somehow just became an assistant zookeeper for some shady dude who owned a popular used car dealership. As bizarre as it sounded, however, I was still young enough to consider it an adventure. What the hell, right? That was the worst that could happen. As it turned out, I'd driven past this place literally dozens of times over the years, but I always assumed it was a scrapyard. The property was surrounded by an enormous sheet metal fence that must have been almost 20 feet high. I could recall sometimes seeing the mast of a crane poking out over the top of the fence. If there was a zoo behind these walls, it was certainly not open to the general public in any way, shape, or form. I bumped my way along a pothole-infested entrance lane and stopped in front of an intercom on a pedestal. I pressed the button and stared at the gate as I waited for a response. It was made from a large section of wall that had been cut out and reinstalled as a massive rolling door. The effect was decidedly uninviting. A tinny voice squawked, Who's this? What do you want? State your business. I said I was there to start my training as the caretaker's assistant, and the voice exclaimed, Oh shit, I forgot you were supposed to show up this morning. I'll be right down. A minute or two later, the gate rolled open and revealed a burly middle-aged man sitting behind the wheel of a golf cart. He was wearing mirrored sunglasses and a baby blue Lacoste tracksuit. One sleeve was pushed up a bit to show off a gold Rolex. His graying hair was combed straight back and pasted in place with hair gel. He glistened in the sun. Vic Bonicelli didn't look like a guy who owned a used car dealership and produced hilariously low-budget commercials for our local radio station. No, he looked more like a mobster. He leaned down to my window and said, This is it, kid. Welcome aboard. You like working here. Every day's an adventure. Vic slapped the hood of my car and grimaced in dismay. He hollered, well, Just look at this poor old gal. She's almost ready for retirement. I'll tell you what, save up a paycheck or two and come down to the dealership. I'll give you the employee discount. I manufactured a smile and said, Thanks, Mr. Bonicelli. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I gotta say, I was pretty surprised this place is actually a zoo. It, uh, well, it... <laughs> Doesn't look like a zoo. Well, uh, we'll get to that in a bit. And don't give me none of that Mr. Bonicelli stuff. You call me Vic. Anywho, just drive straight up to the parking lot. I'll show you around from there. First thing I noticed when I drove past the gate was a smooth transition in the road surface, changing from pothole-ridden gravel to smooth and flawless asphalt. The driveway was bordered on either side by a wrought iron fence. The ground stretched out on either side in endless acres of green lawn and exotic gardens. It was almost surreal. From the outside, this place looked like a scrunchy old junkyard, but a real-life Garden of Eden was hidden away behind the wall. This was definitely no ordinary zoo, and Vic Bonicelli was no ordinary car salesman. The road led to a small parking lot in front of a massive building. It had been built in a slanting, postmodern sort of style, replete with an overhang that was supported by concrete pillars. A monolithic glowing marquee on top of the overhang read, Welcome to Bonesaw Vic's Cryptozoological Gardens. A one-of-a-kind experience. I stared up at the sign as I pulled into the parking lot, and I wondered if it was too late to just throw the Buick into reverse, turn the hell around, and ask Vic to open the gate. Looking at that sign gave me a disquieting feeling in the pit of my stomach. My basic survival instincts were telling me, loud and clear, that I should probably get the fuck out of here immediately. Vic came putting along in his golf cart and beckoned me to follow him to the front entrance. There was a hulking fellow in a dark suit standing on either side of the doorway. Both of them had an automatic rifle slung over their shoulders. They stared at me with open hostility as Vic ushered me inside. Vic noticed the nervous expression on my face and patted me on the back. I don't worry about them, kid. 
They won't bother you unless I tell them to. <laughs> I already told you. You're gonna like it here. Best job in the whole world for someone like you. The entrance vestibule was so big and flashy looking, I thought it was a lobby. The actual lobby was nothing short of stunning. It was the size of a high school gymnasium, and the floor was made of polished marble. There was a heart-freezing sculpture in the middle of the room, a hyper-realistic statue of a six-headed serpentine monstrosity. It stood at least 12 feet high, and it was absolutely horrifying. I asked Vic what he'd meant when he said, someone like you, and he barked over his shoulder, what do you think I mean? Some of the record. You've been busted once for possession with the intention to distribute, and one more for breaking and entering. You got off with a slap on the wrist for the possession charge, but you got four months in the clink, three years of probation for the B&E. Still on probation for another 18 months, am I right? Got a record, it'll keep you from getting a lot of decent jobs. I wasn't surprised Vic had found out about my past transgressions, but I wasn't exactly thrilled either. Muttered, no, it doesn't help me, that's for sure. I don't usually go for anything that requires a, a background check. He clapped a meaty hand on my shoulder and boom. Well, let me tell you something. I don't discriminate against people like you in my hiring process. Just the opposite. I don't want some crybaby snitch working for me. I want good people who know how to keep their mouths shut. <laughs> anyway, we never got a chance to discuss your wages, did we? How about, uh... How does 25 bucks an hour sound? Good with that? Now, no, I'll tell you something. Back in 1996, 25 bucks an hour was some good fucking money. As a point of reference, my recently terminated position as a temp at the factory had paid a whopping $6.40 an hour, which was still above the minimum wage at the time. People with no special training or skills simply didn't make that kind of money. I stopped dead in my tracks and sweated. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. But can you repeat that? How, how much? Vic furrowed his brow. What's the matter? Not enough? No, I get it. I guess I, I could go as high as, uh, let's, let's say 27 bucks an hour. How about that? Are we good? I, I almost fainted from the force of the pure ecstatic gratitude that flooded every cell of my being. I croaked. Oh, man. Wow. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Thank you. Hey, what can I say? Vic grinned. I'm like that Ford guy. I believe my employees should be able to afford my cars. <laughs> you don't see any junkers out in that parking lot, did you? Seriously, I won't be paying you like this over at the dealership. This here, this is different. It's a good job, kid, but sometimes... Sometimes it ain't gonna be easy. You'll see. There was a small group of people waiting for us on the other side of the lobby. They were all wearing what appeared to be some kind of full-body chainmail suit, complete with a chainmail hood. And as we drew closer, I could see that it really was chainmail, along with knee-high leather boots and matching gauntlets. Each one of them had some kind of rifle over their shoulder, as well as a utility belt of gadgets that would have made Batman envious. All of a sudden, that warm, fuzzy feeling from the anticipation of a sweet-ass paycheck shriveled up and disappeared. Vic didn't look like a car salesman. Those people didn't look like zookeepers. They looked like post-apocalyptic warriors. A tough-looking older guy with a heavy mustache stepped forward to greet us. He took one look at the expression on my face, shook his head at Vic, and said in a heavy Eastern European accent, You did not tell him, did you? Vic shrugged and sighed. Nah. Oh, well, shit. Look at the time. I gotta go, kid. This is Casimir, okay? He knows his shit. He's your boss. Listen to him, you'll be fine. Oh, yeah. Payday's Friday. Cash only. He turned back to the tall, grim-faced stranger and said, Take care of him, Kaz. Seems like a nice young fella, you know. Keep him out of the way for, uh, for now. Show him the ropes. I waved my hand to get their attention and said, Hey, uh, I gotta be honest here, Vic. I don't really know about any of this, you know. I don't... Casimir cut me off by seizing me by the arm and swiftly dragging me away. His grip was like iron. He yelled over his shoulder, Not to worry, boss. I'll keep him safe and teach him what he must learn. I struggled in his iron grip and snarled, Let the fuck go of me, weirdo! What the hell is this place? Why are you wearing that shit? The fuck is going on here? Why? A fair-looking woman with angular features interrupted my rant with a loud clap of her hands. She said, If you shut your stupid ass up for a second, he'll tell you what's going on. Just shut up for fuck's sake. The other smirked and nodded in agreement. 
I counted seven of them in total. All of them clad in chainmail armor and what appeared to be some kind of Kevlar bodysuit underneath. As I looked around, it abruptly dawned on me that we were actually eight of them, not seven. I was number eight. First of all, Casimir grumbled, you must know that I just saved your life. Tell me, do you have a wish for death? I gaped at him and croaked, excuse me? The hell are you talking about? Casimir curled his lip at me in disdain and said, You are not a very observant young man. Look around you. All these things you see, they cost more money than you could ever imagine. Where do you think this money comes from? The sales of used cars. This place is a secret, and for good reason. I felt my heart drop in my shoes. My youthful enthusiasm for adventure had fucked me over once again. I said, This isn't actually a zoo, is it? Casimir considered my question and made a seesaw motion with his hands. Hey, the answer is not exactly yes, but not exactly no either. There are living creatures on display, but only the very rich and powerful may come to see them. They pay a fortune for this privilege. This place is secret. Very few people know of its existence. I felt dark, absurd laughter bubbling in my chest. And I clamped down on it hard. This wasn't a joke. I asked, what kind of living creatures are we talking about? Are you people poaching endangered species or some illegal shit like that? I mean, I don't, I don't have a freaking clue what's going on here. They were captured in the wild. This is correct. But I should not have used the word living. Casimir corrected himself. Some of these things, they are not technically alive. I did a double take and said, wait a minute, what? Casimir pointed at the sign hanging above the exit, a reinforced steel door with a small rectangular window at eye level. There was a sign above the door that read, Caretakers must work in pairs. All caretakers must be armed and suited up in the required protective equipment before entering this area. I wish to make something very clear to you, he growled. Today you are only a visitor. You will stand back and you will do exactly as you are told. Do you understand? I gawked up at his stern, hawkish expression and murmured, Yes, sir, absolutely. I felt like a lost child, all alone and very afraid. The feral looking lady snickered at me and said, Poor baby, look at his face. Looks like he's gonna cry. Just wait until he sees what's on the other side of that door. Casimir waved her away and scolded, There is no need to speak like this, Esmeralda. You were no better on your first day. He pulled me over to the door and entered a code on the keypad. The door popped open with a buzzing sound and a mnemonic hiss. And there it is, Kaz said, as he gave me a numbing smile. It is time to begin your education. We all filed into a short, brightly lit corridor, and the entrance swung shut behind us with the clunk of a heavy deadbolt automatically sliding into place. There were two doors on either side of the hall, and the fifth at the end that was labeled Equipment. The others were marked Aviary, Marine, Terrestrial, and... Other. Casimir informed me that we would be in charge of the Terrestrial Wing that week. The caretakers worked in pairs, and they rotated to a different wing on a weekly basis. He punched a code into the keypad beside the door and said, in an ordinary zoo, they would wish for the animals to become more familiar with their handlers, but such things do not matter here. Most of these creatures will never become fond of you. A lot of them will kill you if they get the chance, Esmeralda interjected. They'll kill you deader than dog shit, and they'll eat you. Not necessarily in that order. I didn't like the sound of that. Not at all. I ran my hands through my hair and said, Oh, okay. Sure. Cool. So here's where I'm at right now, okay? I'm not stepping one foot through that fucking door until somebody tells me what the ever-loving fuck is going on in this place. Cryptids. Esmeralda smiled, and she pantomimed scary monster hands to further illustrate her answer. Critters from legends and folklore. There's all kinds of weird shit in here, and it's our job to take care of them. There, they're all up to speed now. I blinked at her for a few seconds, then wheezed. 
What? You're kidding me, right? Stuff like that doesn't... I mean... It's not real. Kazimir arched an eyebrow and said, Come see. He yanked me through the door before I had a chance to scream for help. It swung shut behind us and locked with a muted clunk of multiple deadbolts sliding into place. This new corridor was narrower and much, much longer than the first one. It was lined on either side with more steel doors, most of them set apart at roughly 50 foot intervals. I gazed down the length of that stark, brightly lit stretch of corridor and I thought, this doesn't look like a zoo. It looks like a prison. Kaz made a sweeping motion with his hand and said, this is the surveillance tunnel. The visitors observe the creatures from the other side of its habitat. There are large windows and video screens. I leaned against the wall and said very weakly, I I don't care, I, I want to go home. Kazimir shook his head. He put his hand on my shoulder and patiently explained that I wouldn't get even as far as the parking lot. They'd be intercepted by security and I would disappear, never to be seen again. The only way to earn Vic's trust was to go along with it, and in Kazimir's words, get paid handsomely to have a wondrous experience. I listened to his somber speech and offered a rebuttal. I, as a reasonable and rational person who lived in the real world, was in no way, shape, or form even remotely prepared to come face to face with a, a monster from the pages of a fairy tale. I simply had no interest in doing so. Not then, not ever. I pointed out I was being held against my will, and I cautioned him that I was liable to explosively shit my pants if he forced me to interact with some fairy tale monster. It, it wouldn't be on purpose, of course, but it would probably happen because I wasn't a fucking monster wrangler. I was a reasonable and rational person who lived in the real world. Do you really want to deal with that? I demanded. Cosimir gave me an irritated frown and shrugged his heavily padded shoulders. You can defecate inside your own pants if you wish, but it will not help you. Now listen carefully to me, boy. The service tunnel is where the caretakers gain entrance to the habitats. There is a red button beside every keypad. If something were to go wrong, you must quickly press the button. It will alert the security team, and it will also release a defense mechanism, which will subdue the creature inside. The red button is always a last resort. Do not push it unless I tell you to do so. There was a brass plate affixed to the door, and the words Sasquatch, male, etched above its surface in bold lettering. Casimir said, Have a look through the window. What do you see? I swallowed down a hard lump in my throat and peered through the observation window. Much to my surprise, there was a dimly lit forest scene on the other side of the glass. There were living trees growing in the room, along with various other flora and fauna that you would find any woodland in the northwest. I turned to him and gasped. There's like a frickin' forest in there. How high is that ceiling? We shitballs, they brought in trees and bushes from... All that shit. I can't... Hey, what's that? A looming shape detached itself from the thicker gloom of the shadows. It started shambling towards the door, and when it stepped into a hazy beam of sunlight, I let out an involuntary shriek of terror. It was a furry humanoid that stood at least eight feet tall. A muscular pillar of shaggy hair, dangling arms, and glittering eyes. I stood frozen in place as it came strolling up to the door, too terrified to do anything but point at the glass and make a whining sound in the back of my throat. The creature stooped down to look at me through the window. Its eyes were bright, wide, and almost crackling with barely contained aggression. That is a Sasquatch, Casimir explained. His tone was calm and detached, as if he were delivering a classroom lecture. His name is Harry. I believe he was captured somewhere in the state of Washington. He's a big boy, this one. He weighs over 200 kilos. He is strong enough to tear a man in half. I gathered my courage and leaned a little closer to the window to get a better look at the Sasquatch's broad, simian features. His eyes narrowed and he wrinkled back his lips, bearing a set of strangely large canine teeth. At that same instant, an enormous fist slammed into the other side of the door, making a gigantic bang that sent me scrambling to hide behind Casimir. 
I peeked over his shoulder and yelled, "Fucking way! No, that's a that's that's a that's a fucking Sasquatch, man!" Yes, I know," Kaz said patiently. "The door across the hall is a storage room. It's where you'll find the equipment necessary to care for this creature. You do not need to feed this one. He forages from the plants that grow in his habitat." However, Harry must be groomed several times a week to keep him looking handsome for the visitors. You will find a brush in the storage closet. Bring it to me and take a minute to calm yourself. It will be okay. Casimir will teach you well. I shot a quick glance at the growling brute on the other side of the reinforced glass. He showed his fangs again and I fled to the safety of the storage closet. I came out a few minutes later with a soft horse brush, which I passed over to Kaz with hands that were visibly shaking. I cleared my throat and repeated, that's, that's, a, that's a fucking Sasquatch, man, right? It's a living, breathing, big-ass, friggin' big, Bigfoot. It is, Kaz agreed as he handed me his rifle. This is a tranquilizer gun. If Harry was to ever escape into the service tunnels, you must not hesitate to use it. Just push this safety switch forward, pull the trigger. Do you see this switch on the wall? It activates a two-way intercom. Make sure that it is on whenever one of us enters a cell. I shook my head and stammered, I, I, can't, I can't believe you're actually going in there with that thing. That's crazy. I'm no animal expert, but that thing looks pretty fucking mad. Harry is not a thing, Kazumi corrected, and he is only showing you that he is the boss. You are new to him. He perceives you as a threat. Now you should see him when he is actually angry. It is a sight to behold. I let out a nervous giggle and said, Oh yeah, he's definitely the boss. Look, for real, I don't think you should go in there. Casimir gave me a very slight ghost of a smile and shook his head. Harry is not a very intelligent beast. It's more like a dog. As long as I hold his brush, I'll be his best friend. He loves to be groomed. <laughs> Problem comes when you try to stop brushing him. This requires some teamwork, as you will see. Kaz showed the Sasquatch the brush through the window. Harry pursed his black lips in an ooh of excitement and moved back to allow Kaz to enter, doing a shuffling little jig of excitement as Kaz stepped into the habitat. I watched with my heart in my throat as Harry hunkered down in a clearing and allowed himself to be brushed. I could hear him cooing and chuffing to himself over the intercom, as Kaz carefully worked the knots out of his fur. It would have been kind of adorable, really, except for the fact that I was... afraid for Casimir's life. If the Sasquatch suddenly decided to tear his arms off, I don't think there would be much either one of us could do about it. Kaz would be bleeding out before I could even hit the alarm button. Kaz called out, Can you hear me? I gave him a thumbs up through the glass. He yelled, So when you are done with the grooming... You must run like hell for the door. Harry often becomes upset when the brushing has to stop. The code is 5542, okay? Make sure the door is open. Yes? Okay, I'm going to run for the door, right? Now! He suddenly whirled around and all out sprinted for the entrance. Harry jumped up with a blood-freezing roar and loped after Kaz on all fours, bellowing in savage indignation at the abrupt ending of his grooming session. Kaz leapt through the open door like a football player, diving into the end zone, and I slammed it shut a bare second before the Sasquatch hit the other side. The heavy steel hummed with the force of the new blow. Just a bit too slow. Both of us. Kaz panted. We will do it better next time. I sputtered. Next time? And suddenly I was sitting on the floor. Kaz reached down and hauled me to my feet. My legs immediately gave out and I slithered back to the floor. Kaz put his hands on his hips and grunted. I think you're being just a little bit dramatic, yes? I flailed my arms and screeched, Traumatic! Next time! Hell no! Shit! All over that! I was almost mauled by a Sasquatch, dude! What the fuck? I thought I'd be throwing birdseed to an ostrich or some shit, not getting murdered by a... Uh, giant fucking ape. Kaz closed his eyes, let out a long breath, and leaned down and casually whacked me across the side of the head with a stiff slap. I looked up at him in shock, my head ringing from the brisk contact with his leather-clad palm. And he shook his head at me. 
Gently, he said, That's enough. I'll hear no more of this talk. You're making a fuss over nothing. Did something bad happen to you? No. Could anything bad happen to you? If you're not careful, yes. So be careful. But you always live to see another day. That isn't the big selling point you seem to think it is. I snapped back at him. Get on your feet, boy, Azimir sighed. There are more wonders awaiting you. Come and see. Kaz led me down the hall and asked, What do you know about leprechauns? I said, You gotta be kidding me. But no, she wasn't. The plate on the door was labeled Leprechaun. The leprechaun's name was Dara O'Sonnesy, and according to Kaz, he was, quote, a very angry little man. He thankfully didn't require much in the way of direct care. The main task with Darrow was to pop in every few days and allow him to wheedle a trinket from our pockets. It was good for his mental health to acquire a shiny new treasure every so often, and he also enjoyed berating the caretakers for their shortcomings. He's not an evil creature, this one, but he always is far, but he's always in a foul mood. Being angry brings him joy. Fetch us an item from the chest in there, but only one. Victor would be displeased if we gave him more than one item at a time. I didn't know if leprechauns are dangerous, but I could only assume the average leprechaun would easily kick a human being's ass, hence the gift to win his continued cooperation. I found a wooden chest nestled in a corner of the storage room, and I was stunned to discover that it was full of gold coins, intricate jewelry, and polished gems of every description. I stared at its contents with my mouth hanging open. I was looking at millions of dollars worth of precious metals and gemstones. It was just casually nestled away in an open storage closet. A stockpile of expensive presents for some asshole leprechaun. The absurdity of it all made me want to laugh, cry, and scream bloody murder all at the same time. I blindly grabbed a small necklace from the top of the heap and dropped it into Kaz's hands. Oh, he will not be pleased with this at all, Kaz murmured. Wait and see. He will have some choice words for me today. Kaz made his entry, and I watched with open-mouthed fascination as Dara O'Sonnesy came stomping out of his earthen mound to confront his unwanted visitor. The leprechaun was three feet of red-faced fury in an emerald green waistcoat, complete with matching breeches and a smart-looking top hat. He glowered at Kaz and shouted, What unforgiven sins have I committed to be so cursed with your presence, you lumbering horse's ass? Kaz stoically ignored his insults and presented him with a necklace, a simple gold chain and locket combo. The leprechaun sneered at it and growled, I'm the star attraction of this smoldering dung heap, and this is the best you can do. Bloody fucking outrage, so it is. He asked if Dara needed anything, and the leprechaun snorted. I need you to fuck off out that door and stop bothering me. Say, who's that peeking through the window? Is that your new assistant? Does the sheep-faced bastard know what happened to the last one? Kaz hissed. Shush. He started for the door with the crackling leprechaun hot on his heels. Oh, so no one stole him. Good grace. Surely the lad deserves to know about the poor man's tragic fate. Surely someone should tell him about the... Kaz scrambled through the door and shut off the intercom, cutting Dara off mid-sentence. We stared at each other for an uncomfortable length of time. I said, What happened to the last guy, Casimir? What was this tragic fate the little guy was talking about? Huh? He did not listen. Casimir said quietly, and he did not take care. You, however, you will do both, and you will be fine, okay? Listen to Casimir, and you will be safe. What happened to him? I asked again, is he dead? Yes. Yes, he is dead. He did not listen, and he was killed. So it was his fault, I prodded, and Casimir gave me a reluctant nod. Yes, he did not listen that he paid for this with his life. It was very tragic. I closed my eyes tightly, and through gritted teeth I said, Okay, sure. It was his own fault. He wasn't careful. So. 
So how did he die? Casimir jerked his head up at the ceiling, then leaned in close to whisper, Not now. They're watching. A second later, I heard a loud click echoed from the speaker in the ceiling, and Vic's voice boomed. How we doing, folks? You good? How's he holding up, Kaz? Kaz looked up at one of the light fixtures and said, Very well, Victor. He's learning. The whole experience requires some adjustments, as you know. It really rattles the old brain cage at first, that's for sure, Vic agreed. You got told your whole life that shit ain't real, and then you walk in this place and bam, there they are. Yeah, it's a hell of a thing to wrap your head around, I get that. Vic stopped talking, and during the long pause that followed, Kaz darted a sharp glance at me and shook his head. His look quite clearly said, don't say a word. Well, I thought I'd check in and see how things are going for the new guy. <laughs> Carry on, fellas. Say, why don't you take an early break, huh? Take the kid outside, show him the grounds. You don't have any more direct contact work today, do you? Kaz told the light fixture, There is only one more. I saved the best for last. Ah, shit, the goblin. <laughs> Vic chuckled. I honestly kind of hate that fucking thing, creepy little bastard. Anyway... Go take a break. Show him some of the cool stuff we got outside. Oh, one last thing. Send a kid to my office when you guys are done with the goblin, okay? Talk later. Kaz turned to me with a stiff, unnatural grin and said, Come along then, boy. There is an exit over here. Let us get some fresh air. We stepped into the bright sunshine and fresh air, normal things from the normal world. I breathed in gratefully and said, how did he die, Kaz? What happened? Kaz growled at me to keep my voice down. They might hear you. There are listening devices everywhere. He steered me down a cobblestone pathway to a gazebo that was nestled beside a willow tree. The grounds were even more impressive up close. When you were walking beneath the elaborate archways and strolling across the rustic storybook bridges, the grounds had been landscaped to give off a vague medieval fantasy vibe replete with small castles, mock-ups of peasant farmsteads, and whimsical statues of mythical monsters. At least I assumed they were mythical. After what I'd already seen this morning, I honestly wasn't so sure anymore. Kaz sat me down at a table in the gazebo and, speaking very softly, he told me, Victor had called my predecessor into his office the previous Thursday and shot him dead. Victor had reason to believe the assistant had been planning one way or another to blow the whistle on the zoo and take the whole operation down. I do not know how Victor discovered his intentions, Kaz cautioned me, but I think he probably keeps his employees under surveillance. Keep your secrets close, your opinions even closer. And never speak of them out loud. I turned this information over in my mind and then pointed out that Vic wanted me to come to his office after we were done. Kaz assured me that this would be fine, but added, You must understand this place is more than just an investment to Victor. It is his dream and his passion. He will not hesitate to dispose of anyone who threatens to destroy his dream. You must always take care in this place, especially with the others. My last assistant confided in the wrong person, I think. And now, he is dead. I grimaced and said, Duly noted. I'll definitely keep that in mind. I felt something gently nudge my leg under the table. I leaned down and came face to face with a large rabbit with antlers growing out of his head. We stared at each other for a few seconds, and then it nudged me again with its antler. Hey, Casimir, there's a rabbit with a, a horn down here. What the fuck? The jackalope, he said as he lit a cigarette. Relax, she will not hurt you. Victor allows some of the more harmless creatures to roam free on the grounds. Her name is Clara. And a very long time ago, she was given as a gift to King Arthur. 
Uh, she lives at the zoo. I crooned. Hi, Clara. And she stretched up to plant her muddy paws in my lap and sniff at my shirt. She was twice the size of a normal jackrabbit. Her little antlers were adorable. And I think she likes me. And she responded by crawling fully into my lap, whacking me in the face with an antler in the process. I winced and scratched her behind the ears. I think she likes you as well, Casimir observed. She's normally a very shy creature, that one. I joked that maybe I could just look after Clara from that point on. Kaz shook his head. If only it could be so, he said, and he buttered his smoke in a standing ashtray. We must get back inside soon and attend to the goblin. I asked if I could maybe grab my lunch bag from my car first. Casimir shook his head. I do not think you will wish to eat before we see the goblin, he said. You may regret doing so on a full stomach. Come along and brace yourself for what you are about to witness. The goblin's name was Gort. As it turned out, Kaz was correct. Gort put me off the idea of eating lunch completely. Gort's habitat was dimly lit to the point of being almost completely dark. I squinted through the observation window and said, I can't see shit in here. Why is it so dark? Kaz explained that the goblins prefer low-light environments. He put a flashlight from his utility belt and shone it through the glass, illuminating the mouth of an artificial cave. I could see a number of small bones scattered on the floor, most of them broken and gnawed into splinters. We must go into Gort's cave and clean up his mess. He is a slovenly creature. Go into the storage closet, bring some garbage bags, broom and dustpan, and also a pair of night vision goggles on top of that. I was surprised to discover that night vision goggles actually looked a lot like a fancy zoom lens camera on a head harness. As Kaz adjusted the straps on the harness, I asked him, Is this thing dangerous? Should I be on standby with the trank gun? Uh, Gort could easily kill a man if he wanted to, Kaz admitted, but he has never been physically aggressive towards any of the caretakers. We provide him with an easy life, however... He is not a very pleasant fellow. He makes the leprechaun seem like a kindly old grandfather in comparison. Maybe he'll come out of his cave with his lantern and... Kaz entered the habitat and I was left squinting after him through the window. All I could hear over the intercom was a faint dry rasp of a broom as bones rattled into the dustpan, followed by the rustling of the garbage bag. The longer nothing happened, the more horrible Gort the Goblin became in my imagination. What kind of animal did these bones come from? What the hell does a goblin eat, anyway? Do they eat people? I thought they probably would, given the chance. I mean, why the hell not? Let's have a look at you, I whispered at the window. Come on, dude, let's see your ugly ass in person. I leaned close to the glass, squinting into the darkness. Then a voice like a rusty hinge suddenly shrieked. That's right. Pick up me bones. Pick them all up. Look over there. It's a heap of dung. Pick it up, dung boy. Pick it all up. There was a peal of lunatic laughter, and the scene was abruptly illuminated by the chaotic light of a flickering lantern. The lantern was swinging around in the grasp of the grotesque, twisted horror with bulging yellow eyes. He looked like a cross between... Mickey Rooney and a carnivorous toad. The goblin pointed at Casimir with a stubby claw, then performed a shuffling dance of malevolent glee. He crowed, Put a scare in you, did I? Oh, that's right. Pick up my dung. Straight from me ass to your hands, dung boy. Hot and fresh, just like you like it. Kaz muttered something under his breath and carefully scooped up a large curl of excrement from the dustpan much to the goblin's delight. He shook his fist and yelled, I need more rabbits, dung boy! I need more rabbits to turn into dung! Ha! <laughs> Just for you! You'll get more rabbits soon, Casimir grunted. His face was blank and emotionless. Step aside, please. I'm finished here. Are you sure you're done here? Gort sneered. If I find even one splinter of bone laying upon the floor, I swear... 
I'll wave my ass at the lords and ladies who come to gawk at me this eve. Stones, branch, and dirty asshole for all to see. I swear I will. You would not dare, Cosimir said in a dismissive tone. Victor would have you bound in chains and beaten with a horsewhip. Gort's brash smile faded into a weak and petulant snarl. He growled. They don't abuse me in such a manner. They wouldn't dare. As I recall, they have already done so on several occasions. Kaz corrected him. He would have th I would have thought you would not wish to repeat this experience. However, I can deliver your message to Victor if you would like. They do no such thing, Gort stuttered. Tell him nothing. Kaz nodded and said, it's probably for the best. Step aside, you foul beast, and allow me to leave. The goblin bared his teeth in a cat-like hiss and trudged back. Casimir held the garbage bag away from his body, a faint look of disgust on his face, and he calmly made his way towards the exit. Enjoy your gift, dung boy! Gort shouted after him, and he slid the trap door and his lantern closed, plunging the entrance to his cave into a thick gloom. Come back for more whenever you please. Hot and fresh, just like you like it. Kaz serenely left the goblin behind to rant to himself, and he thrust the garbage bag into my hands before I could pull them away. The smell was wild and explosively ripe. I could only imagine the god-awful stench within the confines of the goblin's habitat. He said, there is a chute for the incinerator behind the trap door on the wall. Get rid of this horrible thing. I choked. How could you breathe in there? And ran for the disposal chute. Old factory fatigue, he grinned. After a minute or two, your brain tells your nose to stop smelling the bad stuff. Kaz gestured at the exit of the end of the service tunnel. The code is the same as the door in the habitats. Victor will be waiting for you. Go on. I'll see you tomorrow. In an excitement of seeing my very first goblin, I had forgotten all about Victor Botticelli. My heart started pounding in my chest. I cleared my throat and squeaked. You... You think it's going to be okay, right? I mean, he's not going to... Uh, it is probably fine, Kaz said. And he gave me another little shrug. A minimal gesture that said, Maybe it will be so. Maybe not. Who knows? Kaz put a large Kevlar-gloved hand on my back and gave me a firm push toward the exit. You came face to face with a Sasquatch. You did not soil yourself, he said. You are made of sterner stuff than you think. Go now. Stay brave. I turned to give him a thumbs up. As soon as the door we shut behind me, I leaned against the wall and started hyperventilating. I considered the possibilities of allowing myself a brief crying session before... I went to see the man who may or may not shoot me dead in his office. But then I remembered. Vic might be watching me on camera, so I gritted my teeth. And I forced myself to stand up straight as an arrow. And I stopped blubbering to myself. Under my breath, I muttered, I just wanted a fucking job. Is that too much to ask? I uttered a silent prayer to whoever might be listening. And I headed out to face my possible doom. I opened the door to the lobby and realized I didn't actually know where the hell I was going. As it turned out, Vic had thoughtfully sent me one of his well-dressed goons to show me the way to his office. He was a brick wall of a human being with a shaved head and no neck at all. Just enormous trapezius muscles that connected to the back of his skull. He said, How you doing there? And somehow it came out more like an aggressive accusation than a question. The boss wants to see you in his office. He led me across the vast lobby with this menacing snake-like statue, and we ducked through a small, unmarked door that opened into a large reception area. It was a tasteful, decorated space, with designer lounge chairs and, honest to goodness, a waterfall burbling out of one of the walls. The water cascaded over the edge of the opening and fell into a shallow pool below. The pool was contained inside an artificial rock basin that glittered with polished deposits of quartz and amethyst. 
I gawked like a child at the decadent display of splendor around us, and I gasped. I've never seen anything like this before. Not in real life. I thought the lobby was something else, but this... This is just crazy. The goon glanced over his shoulder at me and grunted. This ain't crazy. It's some big money in action. The things Mr. Bonicelli got on display here, now that's... That shit's crazy. There was yet another door on the far side of the room, and it was guarded by an icy beauty who sat behind a long and gleaming reception desk. As we drew closer, it became apparent her features were a bit... Well, alien-looking. For lack of a better term, her eyes were almost cartoonishly large, and her nose was a small, fleshy nub nestled above the exaggerated bow of her upper lip. However, it was the elongated points of her ears that really gave her away. I stared at them in shock. Vic's hired muscle gave her a slight bow, then pointed at me with a finger that resembled a ballpark sausage with knuckle hair. He said, Good morning, Miss Dahlia. I brought this guy to see the boss. Speaking in a soft southern accent, Miss Dahlia purred, Good morning, Len, and favored him with a very slight of smiles. She looked over at me and added, Could you be an absolute honeycomb and tell this young man to stop staring at my ears, please? It's not very polite. Without bothering to look at me, Len growled, Mind your manners, Dumbo. Don't stare at Miss Dahlia. I stammered, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, I, I didn't mean to. Shut it, Len commanded. I stopped talking and I looked down at my feet. Miss Dahlia curled her lips at me and picked up the phone. She said, he's here. And then, in a most frostier tone, Victor will see you now. Len gave me an unfriendly push towards the door. It's open. Go in. Victor's office was surprisingly small and plain in comparison to the reception area. He looked up at me from the other side of his desk and gave me a grin. Not much to look at, is it? I'm a simple guy, really. All the pomp and splendor out there, it's for the guests. That's what they pay for. Me? Me, I like something like, uh, more cozy, you know? <laughs> yeah, have a seat, kid. Vic offered me a box of cigars. I declined. He exclaimed, What, no cigar? I got him from Arturo Fanetti. You go great with whiskey, you sure? I stole a glance at the bottom of the Jameson Gold Reserve on his desk and said, well, it's only 10.30 in the morning, but I'll definitely have a drink. Always past noon somewhere in the world, <laughs> Vic proclaimed with a smile, and he poured us both a generous slug in a cut crystal whiskey glass. He nipped the end off a cigar and lit it up with a low groan of contentment. Now I guess you're wondering to yourself, how the hell does a guy end up running a zoo for cryptids? <laughs> Bigfoot, leprechauns, all that shit. They ain't supposed to be real. Now you've seen them with your own eyes. They're just as real as you and me. Quite a shock, ain't it? Choosing my words carefully, I asked, What about the bonesaw Vic part? I mean, that actually caught my attention more than, you know, the cryptid part. Vic leaned back and plopped his sneakered feet up on his desk. Okay, he exhaled. Time for a story. <laughs> so, I had my start working under a boss named Mario Ginetti. I called him Nichols, because he always sit there rolling a shiny nickel back and forth between his knuckles. <laughs> anyway, I was a kid, only 12 years old. He could see I already had more balls and ambition than most of the grown men in his crew. Only position Nichols had for a young kid like me was be a runner for... Numbers games, that's what he did. I made drops for nickels all over Brooklyn on my bike. It wasn't long before I was bringing home three, four times what my old man made as a janitor. Easy. I'll tell you something. A jealous old prick. Uh, he didn't like that too much. And he started getting on my case how I was working for a criminal. <laughs> so I just tossed him ten bucks. You know, I'm getting to piss away at the dog track. Usually kept him out of my business for a while. So everything's good for a while, right? And then a couple mooks tried robbing me. Nah, I was 13 by then, maybe 14. They knocked me off my bike, 
pull me into an alleyway. One of them holds up a knife. Says, give me what's in the bag. So I, so I opened it up, right? Pulled out a 38 special I always carried in there. Damn stupid motherfuckers got what was in the bag. I blinked at Vic from across the desk and murmured, Holy shit. Vic nodded in agreement. Anyhow, he continued. When I turn 18, Nichols let me join the crew. I was a collector and enforcer. Uh, if you were ducking payments on your gambling debts, I'd be the one to come pay you a visit. If I were in a bar somewhere and the boss heard you cracking wise by another table, well, I'd be the one to walk over there and show you the error of your ways. I was good at my job. I enjoyed my work very much. Vic took a sip of his whiskey, basking away in the glow of those fond memories. It wasn't much longer before I started getting contracts. Guy fucks up, gets his name put on a piece of paper. I'd be the last person he'd see in the world. Once again, I was good at my job. I enjoyed it. Lots of traveling around, seeing the sights. It was good. Good work. Despite my deep unease, I was fascinated with Vic's backstory. I said, I don't want to overstep my bounds or anything, but... Vic flapped a hand at me and interjected, Stop, stop, I know what you're going to say. You want to know how many, don't you? I'll tell you something, kid. I honestly lost count. There were a lot of names. A lot of faces. It was a long time ago. Anyway, in those days... I'd always carry a bone saw in the car. It's a lot easier to deal with them afterward if you'd... And, you know. Vic made a sawing motion and grinned. I tried to grin back, but failed miserably. So they started calling me Bone Saw Vic. I like that just fine. With a nickname like that, people always treat me like the utmost respect, you know. Yeah, one day I got a call about a scumbag. Wouldn't pay in his debts. Real hard on this guy. Nichols sent a couple of boys over to rattle his cage. Didn't go their way. Put them both in the hospital. Two big, tough guys. Put them both in the intensive care unit. So I tracked this guy down. A motel room somewhere, right? Kick in the door. Put six in his chest. Pop, pop, pop. Do them right there and then. But he didn't die. Vic chuckled to himself and knocked back the rest of his whiskey. Right before my own eyes, raggy looking little fuck bounces off the floor, smashes through the window. I run outside after him, but he's gone. Just zoom! Gone in seconds. Blur down the road. Long story short, turns out the guy wasn't human. He was a vampire. That's when I discovered the world of cryptozoology, kid. Fast forward 30 years. Here we are. Many questions. I pointed at the door and said, Your receptionist, she's... She's not human either, is she? Vic snorted. Her? <laughs> Hell no, Miss Dahlia is a water nymph. Best secretary you can ever ask for, that gal. She used to live in a freshwater stream, right? So we siphoned off a bunch of the water, made her that waterfall out there. I tell you, she she is never late for work. <laughs> I nodded my head and drained my glass. A water nymph? Oh, sure. Why not? I tentatively pushed the glass across the desk and tilted my head at the bottle. Vic crooned, attaboy, and poured me another one. He slid it back in front of me and exhaled. So, yeah, I didn't call you in here to tell you my life story. First of all, I want you to know you did a great job in there today, kid. You didn't start crying like a bitch when that fucking Sasquatch came running at the door. He didn't try to run away, neither. No, those other guys, those other caretakers, uh, they're a pretty rough bunch. Soldiers, mercenaries, cutthroats, all that description. You went in there. You did what they do. That's something to be proud of. 
Most people, they couldn't do it. You got big brass balls, kid. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Maybe it's just the whiskey, but Vic's praise went straight to my heart. I'd never had an employer say anything positive about me before. I mean, not once. I felt my face flush red and I sputtered. <laughs> thank, thank you, Vic. Uh, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll try my best each and every day. I won't, uh, you know, I, I won't say anything to anyone about the place. I can keep a secret. Sure you can, Vic beamed. That's why I hired you. You did your time like a man. You didn't rat no one out. Tough little bastard. Tougher than you know. Stern stuff, I agreed, and held up my glass and a toast. Thank you, Vic. I mean it. Vic cautioned. Yeah, don't thank me yet. You ain't been inside one of them habitats yet. It's not different when you got Harry staring you in the eye. Ain't got no door between you. That's when you earn your money. And that reminds me. Vic stabbed the intercom button on his phone and said, Ms. Dahlia, can you bring in that envelope? The water nymph glided through the door and dropped the white envelope on the desk. She smelled faintly of moss, minerals, and rich, dark earth. And her hair fell like dusky waterfalls across her back. I realized I was staring at her again with my mouth agape, and I forced myself to look away. You're all wide eyes and racing heartbeats, aren't you, sugar? Miss Dahlia noted in a crisp, frosty tone. I started an apology and looked down at my glass. I could feel my face burning with embarrassment. Miss Dahlia paused beside Vic on her way out of the room. She patted him on the shoulder and the stage whispered, Don't let this baby boy anywhere near that succubus. So, Victor, the poor thing wouldn't stand a chance against that shameless hussy. He'll be fine, Miss Dahlia. Vic grumbled. Thank you, and that'll be all for now. She frowned at him and left, closing the door just a little too hard behind her. Vic shook his head and sighed. I'll tell you something, that pretty ones, they always hate each other. <laughs> anyway, figured you're probably kind of broke right now, am I right? Sure I am, I'm always right. This is a week's pay. He handed me the envelope. Call it a signing bonus. Get yourself a good haircut, maybe some new clothes. Take a nice girl out for dinner and a movie. Have a celebration. Made the cut. There's one thing you gotta... I stopped listening right after he said, This week's pay, because I was too busy staring into the envelope with my eyes bulging out of my head. I'd never seen so much money in my entire life. I blurted, thank you so much! And Vic abruptly stopped talking. His smile disappeared. He jabbed a finger in the air like a dagger and barked, Shut up! I ain't done talking yet. You made the cut, yes, but I'm not. I'm gonna have to stress something here, okay? If you fuck this up, they will never find your body. You got me? Not one hair, not one tooth, not even a button off your shirt. You'll be gone. Do you understand me? I looked in the eye and saw that he wasn't a threat. Vic was simply telling the truth. I nodded and I croaked, yes, yes sir, I understand. He studied me for an agonizingly long period of time. I forced myself to hold his gaze and keep my expression neutral. The euphoric rush of holding all that back rent in my hand shriveled and died in the laser beam intensity of those searching eyes. I can't remember being keenly aware of compensation of that kind. I can remember being keenly aware of my own mortality and questioning if there was any amount of money that could adequately compensate for that kind of mortal terror. The answer was yes, of course, and the amount was whatever I was holding in my hands at that moment. I didn't have any other choice. I'd seen too much. There was no going back. And then it passed. And Vic slowly reclined in his chair, making the springs squeal and torment beneath the burden of his bulk. He puffed his cigar and wheezed at the ceiling. Yeah, I want to believe you're a good kid. I want to believe this. So I will. But don't you ever give me a reason to regret my faith in you. The beast. Softly, I said. I'll never be anything but 
an asset to the organization. But I'm a hard worker, and I, I'll never be the word to anyone. Promise. Vic pursed his lips and said, We'll see. He pushed a button on the keypad of his bulky desk phone, and seconds later, Len poked his head in through the door. We'll see you tomorrow, kid, Vic said, and his smile returned, transforming him from a murderous thug to fatherly businessman in the blink of an eye. Show up the same time as today. Go directly to the service tunnel. Kaz will be waiting for you. I tried to thank him one last time, but Vic waved me away and poured himself another drink. Big day tomorrow. You gotta get suited up for entry. Think you're ready. Go on, get out of here. Get yourself some lunch. As Len briskly marched me through the reception, I noticed an expensively dressed man sitting on one of the designer chairs. He was reading a newspaper and sipping a Perrier while he waited to see the boss. I took a closer look and recognized him as a very famous film director. He looked up and gave me a cordial nod as we passed. I turned to Len when we got to the lobby and started to say, Hey, was that? Len snapped, I don't know, loud mouth, was it? I immediately stopped talking. The message was clear. Some things were not to be said out loud. At least not by the likes of me, a lowly caretaker's assistant. I was to be seen and not heard. Len followed me out of the gate to a golf cart and pushed the button to let me out. I stuck my arm out of the window to wave at him as I drove away, but it wasn't returned. The gate rolled shut behind me, clunk. And if it weren't for the envelope of cash stuffed in my pocket, I would have been tempted to believe the whole thing was a bizarre hallucination. But it wasn't a hallucination. I was the new caretaker's assistant at Bonesaw Dick's Cryptozoology Gardens. There was no turning back. I went straight home and slept for hours. I think I must have been in shock. I dreamed about four-mouthed boogeymen, elven beauties with raven hair, and gangsters with bone saws in their trunks for their cars. I woke up starving and ordered a deluxe pizza with garlic bread, wings, the whole works. I tipped the delivery guy 20 bucks. I ate like a king while I sat in the dark, watching the moon rise through the window as I sorted my troubled thoughts. The creatures in Vic's facility were inmates. Their habitats were jail cells. Some of them might belong there, but not all of them. Harry, for example, belonged in the wild, running free in a real forest with others of his kind. He wasn't necessarily good or evil. He, he, he just was. His only crime was daring to exist in a world that didn't believe in his existence. I thought about Kaz's threats to the goblin, about chains and horse whips. I knew that it wasn't right. The goblin might be repugnant and nasty, but what was his real crime? Not wanting to be gawked at by visitors? It was right. None of it was right. I was just about to call it a night when my eyes were drawn to a red glow on the street below. I saw a man leaning against a dark sedan, smoking a cigarette, yet staring up in my window. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but it made my heart beat a little faster regardless. I crawled into bed and I stared at the ceiling for a long time. Around one in the morning, I got up to take a leak and I took a peek out the window after I was done. Sure enough, he was still out there, sitting in the sedan, smoking in the dark. I took the money with me when I went back to bed nuzzling up to the precious envelope like it was a teddy bear. I decided they could watch me all they wanted. Didn't matter. For better or worse, I'd hopped on this crazy train with my luggage in hand. But there was nothing I could do but come along for the ride. I fell asleep, and this time, I dreamt of nothing at all. In the morning, I didn't wake up as a nobody. I woke up as a caretaker's assistant. Despite the circumstances of my employment, I was excited for a new day. And I'm not going to lie. It felt pretty damn good. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Kiwi Pasta, And as always, I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. If you guys are interested in finding new books from authors that you hear of on this channel, please pay attention to the links in the description down below. 
For one, you can always get a hold of my books, which are the Creepypasta Collections Volume 1 and Volume 2, but also from a bunch of my other friends, such as Jack Townsend, where Tales from the Gas Station Volume 4 is currently available. You can find a link in the description, as well as a link to all of my audiobooks I've done for Volumes 1 through 3. And yes, trust me, I'm going to be working on 4. It's just going to take me a while. And as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who is on my Patreon. That means everybody. Everyone who is from the $1 tier all the way up to the God, why do you pledge that much tier? But I especially want to give a big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Kyle Resnack, Happy Birthday, Ollie Whale, David Martin, Scarrington the Unkempt, Angelus, Spanky, Snoochy Boochies, Autistic Spidey, Freddy, Seclude, Lupta Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Rebecca Harper, Merxenum, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Cato Baker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Chaos Arts, Cryolinian, Zachary Grofius, Lord Life's Best, Goreng Tri Magacy, Maria Walker, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Naughty Devil, Voice of Sands, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Chelly J, Jeremy H, Rueltazol, Ficomel, Nana, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Suzaku, Croconut 509, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Zicardi, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Benjamin Wilvart, Kiri the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, you guys are the MVPs. Everybody who's on that list, everybody who's on that Patreon, everybody who's in the description, thank you so much. And if you'd like to join this list of names that I horribly mispronounce, head over to patreon.com slash mrcravypasta. And as always, everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>